Here begins tape number one in the deposition of Hitesh Amin, MD, in the matter of Randolph Wiggins et al. versus MedStar Southern Maryland Hospital Center Incorporated et al. in the Circuit Court for Prince George's County. Case number CAL 16 37868. Today's date is June 14th, 2017. The time is 10 13 a.m. The video operator today is Brian Mackey. This deposition is taking place at the office of Pessant Cats, 901 Delaney Valley Road, Towson, Maryland. Counsel, please identify themselves and state whom they represent. Justin Zuber on behalf of the plaintiff, the estate of Renee Wiggins. I'm Janet Ferrero on behalf of MedStar Southern Maryland Hospital. Natalie Magdeberger on behalf of Dr. Amin and Washington Surgical Specialists. Court reporter today is Sherry Smith. Will the reporter please swear in the witness? I do. Uh, good morning, doctor. My name is Justin Zuber. Going to be taking your deposition here today. Have you ever had your deposition taken before? Yes, I have. On how many occasions? Objection. On if yeah, I can just have a continuing objection. Sure, That'd sure. Helpful. Um, I can recall about four times. Okay. And do you remember? Can you tell me, starting with the first one, if you can recall what year that took place in? Same continuing objection. <coughs> um. I believe that was around 2012 or 2013 time frame. I don't know exactly when that was. Okay. Uh, do you remember any of the allegations in that case? Uh, yes, that was uh, a case where um, there was an alleged delay in treatment um, on a patient who had an obstructing colon lesion. And is that case still pending in any sort of jurisdiction? No. Okay. Do you remember where that case was filed? Prince George's County. Did it go to trial? No. Okay. The uh, second case, what year was that in? Um, maybe a year, two years later, 2014. Okay, and what were the allegations in that case? Um, that was a case where um, patients suffered a leak following um, surgery and uh, it was alleged that there was a delay in diagnosis. Okay. And what case, or where was that filed in? Prince George's County. And is that case resolved? It has been resolved, yes. It went to trial and we had a defense verdict for myself and my corporation. Okay. Were you the primary defendant in that case? I believe I was. Okay. Just for the record, there were two other defendants, well, three. three other defendants. There was a primary care physician group, so two of them, and then uh, Dr. Balakasin, who was a partner of Dr. Okay. Means, and there, um, there was a verdict against the primary care physicians. Okay. I understand. And uh, the third case, remember what year that was in? Um, I gave a deposition maybe last year, 2016 or, or late 2015. Okay. And I'm assuming you were a named defendant in that case as well? Yeah, I believe I was the sole defendant in that case. Okay. And was that in Prince George's County as well? Yes. And what were the allegations in that case? Um, improper management of uh, a post-operative wound. And I'm assuming that case is probably still pending? No, that case was dismissed by the plaintiffs with prejudice. Okay. Was it dismissed immediately after your deposition? Pretty much. Okay. And the fourth case, which case is that? And it was dismissed without settlement. Okay. It was just dismissed voluntarily. Sure. Um, and last case I just was deposed last year. Um, that was a case, again, uh, filed in Prince George's County. Um, I believe I was the primary defendant in that case as well. Sole defendant. Sole defendant. Um, case went to trial, and again, we have a defense verdict for myself. Okay. What were the allegations in that case? Um, 
allegation uh, basically of complications complications from a uh, lap band removal surgery and insertion insertion and removal yeah who is the plaintiff's attorney in that case um, do you recall Natalie I don't I don't recall the attorney at this time okay do you remember I it's the bath of effect <laughs> Do you have uh, that, Justin, yet? <laughs> I, yeah, well, um, it, that case, did it involve the use of a Visiport choker at all? Um, I used it, but that was not part of the allegations. Okay. Um, where did, was that an operation which took place at Southern Maryland? Yeah, um, the patient had surgeries at Doctors Community Hospital and at Southern Maryland. Okay. Uh, where you used the Visiport, was that at Southern Maryland or Doctors Community? Um, that would have been both of those surgeries. Okay. She so had an insertion and a removal. I see. And the removal was complicated by infection and wound problems, and that was the allegation of improperly diagnosing the wound issues. Okay. And the removal, <laughs> that took place at Southern Maryland? That took place um, at Doctors. Doctors, doctors okay. Community Hospital. And you said that there was an allegation regarding the insertion? Uh, yeah, so she had a port that flipped, mm -hmm. and the port flip uh, required us to reoperate. And during that reoperation, she developed a wound infection, which ultimately required the band system to be removed. Okay, but as you said, none of that had anything to do with the use of the Visiport trocar. That's correct. Okay. So uh, these are obviously cases where you. There's another case, though, just so that the record's complete. I think he's forgotten about the the um, record. Right. Mm -hmm. That was also last year, um, so the deposition occurred last year. That case was, I understand, just recently dismissed by the courts. Um, and uh, that one is also an allegation of uh, injury um, or a complication from lap in uh, insertion, or sorry, it was a ventral hernia repair, but it did involve a visiport. Um, uh, so there's a complication during entry of using a visiport. Okay, where was that case filed? Prince George's. Okay. And you were the sole defendant in that case? Uh, no, I believe the hospital is also named. Okay, and that would be Southern Maryland Hospital? Yes, Southern Maryland okay. Hospital. And uh, did the allegations have anything to do with the use of the Visiport? I'll let him answer allegations, but since the case is still pending, I'm not going to let him answer okay. anything further beyond that. That's but fine. Yeah, they're alleging that there was a complication from the entry technique. Okay. Do you know the name of the plaintiff's attorney in that case? Uh, I don't recall. I'm sorry. Okay. When were you deposed? This was also last year. Remember what month last year? <sighs> no. Can um, you give me a season? Winter? Yeah, summer? it seemed like, I think it was um, sort of beginning of the year, maybe February, March would be. Okay. All right, so I think those are cases where you provided testimony as a defendant. Have you ever testified in a case as a medical expert? No, I have not. Okay. All right, so I'm going to have this marked as exhibit number one. This is his CV. Dr. Jump is going to show you this briefly, but then I need it back so I can ask you questions about it. Sure. But is that an updated <coughs> and accurate copy of your CV? Yes, this appears to be. Okay. Okay, once you let him keep that, you can use okay, this. Okay, sure. That works. That, that way, <coughs> and keep the exhibits um, together. Doctor, I know a lot of this is kind of written down here already, but can you just kind of briefly describe for me your educational background? Mm -hmm. um, so I earned my BS at Emory University. Um, went on to do my uh, medical school at St. George's University in Grenada, where I um, earned an MD degree, uh, after which I immediately transitioned into residency at Case, well, they, they now call it Case Medical Center. At the time, it was called Case Western Reserve uh, University Program. Um, I completed my residency in five years, and then I um, entered clinical practice immediately after. Why did you choose to go to St. George's? Objection. Relevance, you may answer. It was one of the schools that accepted me, so I decided to go. 
were you accepted to any schools in the U.S.? No. Objection to relevance. Move to strike. And actually, uh, Mr. Zuber, I'd ask you to move on because, as you well know, there's case law in Maryland that is not relevant. It's not admissible. So you're just tweaking the doctor, which I don't think is appropriate. Okay. Let's stay professional. <coughs> I didn't realize I was unprofessional. Well, that um, you know those questions are not admissible, nor are they relevant. Um, there's case law right on point. So if you're trying to make it, uh, having had it, Having had a daughter that's just gone through the medical school admission process, I can tell you it's completely and utterly crazy, um, and it's very difficult. And so to ask that question is designed to try to, you know, make the doctor feel bad about himself when in actuality he should be thrilled that he got into a medical school because it's really hard. I understand, and I'll do you the same courtesy if you do me the courtesy of not doing speaking objections. It's as well. not an objection. This is a statement on the record. Okay. Well, in the future, speaking objections, I would appreciate it. it the it's not an objection. It's a statement on the record. Okay. There's a way difference. And I'm not doing any speaking objections. I'm asking you to, to maintain, let's stay professional during the deposition. Okay. Um, doctor, if you could, uh, your professional work experience, um, you said you did your residency at Case Western? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, when were you first introduced to the Visiport trocar? That was during my residency. Okay. Actually, I had been exposed to it as a medical student. I'd seen it in operation, but I never actually utilized it until my residency. Okay. And it looks like you started that residency in 2001, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, I know in your answers and interrogatories you had mentioned that you recall seeing the package insert back when you were in your residency, I believe. That's correct. Okay. The package, do you remember what year you may have seen that package insert? It's 16 years ago. I mean, any time during my residency. Typically, most of the um, opportunities to have really more, I would call it background education, would occur in the first two to three years of residency. The, the last couple of years are really more about operating room and, you know, patient care. So. We had a lot of extra time for reading and things like that the first couple of years, so I would imagine that's when I saw it. Okay. Do you recall if when you saw the, the package insert for the first time, if at that point the manufacturer was suggesting that it not be used without prior CO2 insufflation? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Okay. Are, are you aware that at some point in time, the manufacturer was saying that the Visiport trocar should not be used without prior CO2 insufflation. Objection to Foreman Foundation, you may answer. I'm not aware of any um, literature from the manufacturer that says that the Visiport must be used with insufflation. In fact, I'm aware of literature that says that uh, insufflation is at the discretion of the surgeon based on the conditions of the case. So um, I'm not aware of anything that says you must use insufflation with that device. Okay. You've never <clears throat> no, strike that. <clears throat> do you have any such literature? I do. We'll disclose that in discovery. I don't have it with me here today. I'd like to, if, if you're going to ask some questions about it, since your discoveries do too, I'd like to have it before you ask any more questions about it, or else we'll just uh, defer to answer those questions until we've seen what you have. That's fair. I'm not going to ask him any questions about the okay. literature. Fair. Um, doctor, with regards to your. Um, when you first were trained on using the VisiPort, what, what kind of training was that? Well, again, it was residency, so at first it's observational. Um, you scrub into cases where the attending is doing most of the operation. You may assist during the operation, and then eventually you get to the point where you become the primary surgeon and the attending will assist you. Um, so, again, my first exposure to a VisiPort was just observing from the sidelines as a medical student. And then when I got into residency, a little bit closer touch to the VisiPort, you know, maybe handling it, you know, seeing how it operates, and then ultimately during the course of my residency getting to use it to enter the abdomen. Do you know how many procedures, I mean, when you first were trained to use it, were you, did, was someone there with you? and showing you hands-on how to use it, and then you started gradually doing the procedure yourself? 
That's correct. So that's how residencies work in general with all procedures and all devices. Uh, so anything from endomechanical staplers to laparoscopic equipment, cameras, you at first familiarize yourself with the equipment uh, from observation and they you know, will instruct you how these devices work. Ultimately, they will trust you enough to then use the um, equipment under supervision and then ultimately uh, you will use it um, with more freedom and, and more independence um, and then um, the attendings will basically just kind of uh, watch as you do the procedure. So when I was first exposed to it, I was still a medical student. I could see how they were using it to enter the abdomen. Okay. Um, when you received your training, did you receive any sort of training about using prior CO2 insufflation? With the Visiport right. per se or? No, with the with Visiport. With all, okay. Right. So yes, during my training, um, we learned about the various entry techniques. Um, the VisiPort technique is not a singular technique. It's a device that can be used um, in various entry techniques. So some techniques um, require or can be used with prior insufflation. Some require prior insufflation. Some, it's at the surgeon's discretion. For the VisiPort specifically, every time I had seen it used, both in my medical school training and residency, it was typically, I won't say every time, but typically, was used without insufflation. On rare occasions, um, the surgeons would choose to <coughs> insufflate the abdomen prior to using the VisiPort. And can you describe for me the occasions where you would want to use prior CO2 insufflation with the VisiPort? I mean, I don't think I can give you every instance. I mean, every case is different, as you can imagine. Um, but, you know, certain cases where um, you're having difficulty with another technique. You may you choose to uh, insufflate the abdomen before attempting to use the VisiPort. If you've used the VisiPort and were unsuccessful, you may choose to then convert to an insufflation technique where you insufflate the abdomen and then try the VisiPort again. Um, so I again, it, each case is different and in each case you do what you think is um, the most likely to succeed and is going to be a safe technique. What is the reason for prior CO2 insufflation? Um, in general, um, insufflating the abdomen um, helps control the fascia. The fascia is the tough connective tissue layer that is surrounding the abdominal muscles. Um, is, and that is the toughest layer to penetrate when you um, are entering the abdomen. So when you have some measure of control of the fascia by either grasping it with your hand or using an instrument to clamp it and grab it or to simply elevate it with air inside the belly, it allows you to control the fascia so it doesn't move around. The abdominal wall is not like a structural wall inside of a building, it's, it's a fluid structure and it, it bends and flexes and uh, that bending and flexing is something that you want to try and minimize as much as you possibly can. And so sometimes, uh, in order to do that, you could use one of these various techniques to help control the fascia. And it, maybe you answered this, but I'm just trying to clarify it. Um, are there times where it, you must use CO2 insufflation prior to the use of the VisiPort, or is it something which is just left up to professional judgment? I believe it's left up to professional judgment. There's no circumstance that I'm aware of that you must use insufflation. It, it, entry techniques, again, are varied. Even the known techniques are kind of broad umbrellas, and within them, surgeons can do them in slightly different ways. Um, so um, any technique, whether it's optical trocar, which VisiPort is one of those, um, Hassan or varies. Uh, surgeons can do them in, in different ways. The only technique that I know requires insufflation is what's known as the varus technique. Uh, but these optical entry techniques, uh, such as the VisiPort technique, I don't know of any um, requirement to insufflate. In your practice, have you ever used the uh, varus needle to insufflate prior to the use of the um, VisiPort trocar? Yes, I've used all techniques to enter the abdomen, varus, Hassan, optical trocar, um, and all of these techniques are something that I uh, sort of keep in my toolbox because every case is different, as I mentioned earlier. So some cases you may choose to use a different technique because of the area that you need to visualize, because of the patient's um, uh, status, you know, having surgery or not having surgery, the, the level of obesity. Um, sometimes it's just as simple as intuition. This is going to be easier if I try it this way. 
So, um, as you know, um, medicine and surgery is more of an art than it is a complete science, and so it's up to the surgeon's discretion to determine what's going to be the, the best way for them to enter the abdomen. It sounded like you gave me some of the factors that you consider in making that determination about whether or not you would use prior CO2 insufflation before using the Visiport. Are there any other factors besides that that you would take into consideration? I, mean, I, I would take everything into consideration at that point. I mean, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the, some of the few things, you know, whether the patient had had prior surgery, uh, whether the um, area of interest, um, you know, was in the midline versus in multiple quadrants, um, how obese was the patient, you know, what has worked in the past. Had that patient had a different injury technique that I knew about that worked well for them? So uh, I, I don't think I could enumerate everything. Uh, again, every case is different, and you know you just have to go with what you have in front of you in terms of that individual patient and what that case is all about. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any risks of doing CO2 insufflation with a varus needle prior to the use of the Visiport choker? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Every single entry technique has potential risks. Um, the varies needle specifically, um, it is a blind pass being made through the abdomen. There's no visualization of the tissue layers, uh, which is what you get in optical entry techniques. Um, so uh, people have certainly punctured the bowel and blood vessels underneath in the abdomen. Um, in uh, extreme cases where um, the varus needle enters an arterial or venous structure and insufflation is started, uh, you can get air embolism and essentially patients will have near immediate cardiovascular collapse and can die. Um, certainly uh, you can not be in the peritoneal cavity and you can insufflate into the subcutaneous tissue causing tissue injury, hematomas, um, you know, people have had air uh, tracking along the abdominal wall or the chest wall and that may compromise respiration. So um, Varys needle um, has, you know, multiple potential complications. Those are the ones that I'm sort of most familiar with. With regards to the ear embolism, have you read any sort of studies or literature indicating the percentage risk of an ear embolism with regards to uh, the use of a varus needle? I mean, off the top of my head, I don't, I can't point to any particular literature about a percentage, no. Okay. I, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, do you know, is, is that a common complication or is it a rare complication? Air embolism specifically? Right. I would say it's an uncommon complication. Okay. Um, with regards to injury to vascular structures, well, let me back up. How large is a varus needle? They vary in size. Um, some of them are uh, very small gauge, other ones are a little bit wider. The length of the needle can vary as well depending on the manufacturer. And manufacturers tend to make different size needles for different size patients. How large is the varus needle in comparison to the Visiport Troker? Um, I mean, a varus needle is going to be, you know, just a millimeter or two in, in diameter, uh, whereas um, the Visiport is about 10 millimeters across, 10 to 12. Okay. Um, and the vascular injuries that have occurred because of the use of the varus needle, um, I'm assuming that's because the needle has actually punctured in some fashion or damaged the vascular structure th with entry? That's typically how that happens, yes. Okay. Would because of the size of the varus needle versus the size of the Visiport Troker, would you agree with me that typically those injuries have been found to be smaller to the vascular structures compared to what you would see with a Visiport Troker? No objection to form and foundation in the answer. No, uh, typically I wouldn't say that that's the case. The, the downside of the varus needle is that it's very thin and its single point of fixation is the fascia. So it creates a fulcrum around which the needle can spin around and twist and turn. And that spinning and twisting motion that inevitably happens after you've inserted into the abdomen can really tear open a pretty big hole into an artery or vein. So bleeding can be just as aggressive and just as dangerous with varus entry as it can with Visiport uh, or even a uh, Hassan technique. Um, uh, and and sur some surgeons have used the varus needle as their point of entry to insufflate the abdomen they're insufflating into a vessel, and maybe not fully to create an air embolism, but enough to, you know, continue that uh, structure to bleed. 
and then they follow with another trocar, and then that has led to even further damage because they're following the same track that that varus needle has gone through. So varus is, uh, based on the literature, just as dangerous as any other entry technique, and, and that's really the important point here is that all these techniques have complications and risks. Uh, these are things that we discuss with patients uh, right up front, and uh, you know, these are not things that we specifically go into in terms of I'm going to use a Varus technique or a Hassan technique, but we talk about potential injury um, during entry procedures. The vascular complications from the use of a Varus needle, are those common? I would say they're just as common as the other techniques, yes. Well, I guess what I'm taking out of 100% and meaning that it would happen every time you used it, I mean, percentage-wise, is that a common complication or a relatively rare complication? Complication. Objection to form and foundation. You may answer if you know. And I'll join. So uh, I'm not really sure how you're using the word common. I mean, is is two percent common or is ten percent common? Uh, I, I would say complications of entry where a vascular injury occurs is is, is probably five percent or less of all cases. Uh, I couldn't give you an exact number beyond that. Okay. Now, with respect to the use of the Visiport optical troker, is it your understanding that the percentage risk is the same as the varus needle? Well, are you talking about in general, or are you talking about with me? Well, I'm talking about in general, and then maybe we'll, we'll kind of boil down and talk a little bit more about your experience with it. Okay. Um, so vascular energy specifically, I think it, it's... Uh, the more common injury with a varus entry technique is more of a bowel injury than a vascular injury. Vascular injuries have been described. How it compares to an optical trocar entry or a visiport entry, I'm not, I'm not certain. Okay. What are the risks of using the visiport optical trocar? Uh, the risks are pretty much the same as any other entry technique. You can have um, uh, inappropriate placement, you know, in the subcutaneous tissue or the muscle, so you didn't actually enter the abdomen and you're blowing air into the wrong space. Certainly once you're in the abdomen, any internal structure could be injured, a solid organ like the spleen, liver, uh, the hollow viscous is like the uh, small bowel, colon, stomach, and then vascular structures. Um, so any of those things could get injured during entry. With regards to vascular structures, what is the percentage risk of possible complications with the use of the Visiport optical trocar. Uh, again, I'll have to um, repeat my earlier answer. I think it's about the same as, um, you know, uh, all the other techniques, probably 5% or less. Okay. And when we say vascular structures, obviously that, that's kind of a broad category. Um, are there certain vascular structures which you know are more likely to be injured with the use of the Visi Visiport optical trocar? No, I mean, I think any, any vessel that's in the way of your entry technique or, or just below your entry port um, is a potential um, uh, structure that could get injured. Okay. <clears throat> you had mentioned uh, your experience with the use of the Visiport optical trocar. Can you tell me a little bit about that as, as far as the, the risk of complications? What do you want to know? That's a pretty broad question. Well, I asked, I think I was specifically asking you before about the risk of vascular complications. I mean, can you tell me a little bit about that? What objection to form and foundation, <coughs> the general nature of the question, what, what do you want them to tell you? In your experience, what is the, the risk of injury that you've seen with vascular complications using Visiport? Objection, I think that's been asked to answer, but you may answer it again. Yeah, so uh, Visiport technique, which is really what I would refer to as optical trocar entry technique. That's not just a Visiport device. There are other devices that you can use the same technique. But optical entry techniques, I think, have the same uh, vascular injury complication rate as um, uh, Hassan and um, Varus in my experience. I don't like the fact that you're passing things blindly through the abdominal wall. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly the, the risk of air embolism by insufflating into a vessel and potentially further tearing it by the motion of the needle um, is very uh, concerning to me. So um, I choose not to do it because I'd rather see the tissue layers as I go through. 
Um, I tend to use the Hassan technique a lot if I'm going into the midline, but if I'm not going into the midline, um, that technique is also um, concerning to me um, just because I have seen, and you know, I wasn't a surgeon at the time, I was a resident at the time, but uh, I'm aware of a case where the surgeon used a blade to cut the fascia and ended up cutting the aorta underneath. Um, so um, all of these techniques can have vascular injury. I use the technique on that particular case, on that particular patient that I think is going to get me the best access to the abdomen. Uh, that's sort of the best way I can answer that question. Okay. <clears throat> Currently you're employed by Washington Surgical Associates, is that correct? No. Um, I'm employed by Doctors Community Hospital, if line one. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, back at the time of this case, which was 2013, is that when you were employed by Washington Surgical Associates? Specialist, Specialist, yes. oh, okay. When did you uh, switch to Doctors Community Hospital? Um, June of 2014. Okay. And can you just briefly tell me the reason why you switched? Um, so at the end of 2012, um, this uh, Southern Maryland Hospital Center was acquired by MedStar. Um, and MedStar um, made me an offer to purchase the practice for myself and my partner, Washington Surgical Specialist. Um, in response to that, we actually had an open bidding process. Um, Doctors Community Hospital, Holy Cross Hospital, and MedStar made offers um, to purchase the assets of the practice and employ us as physicians. Um, ultimately, we decided to go with doctors. Okay. And uh, your old practice, Washington uh, Surgical Specialist, um, how many physicians were employed by that practice? Well, we had two members, myself and uh, Dr. Balkasun was my partner. We're 50-50 uh, partners in, in terms of ownership. And in 2013, we may have had three surgeons or two or three surgeons working as employees for us. Okay. Back in 2013, can you kind of describe for me what that practice did, what kind of operations, what kind of patients you would see? Uh, we were almost entirely general and bariatric surgery. Uh, we didn't do any vascular or thoracic surgery. Um, the um, surgeons were not um, specifically um, specializing in any subcategory of general surgery, so we did kind of a little bit of everything. And I guess back in 2013, you can tell me if it's the same way now, um, but what kind of surgeries were you performing back then? Uh, at that time, I was probably 70% general surgery, 30% bariatric surgery, um, and today I'm probably closer to maybe uh, the, the, the flip, maybe 60, 65 percent bariatrics, 35 to 40 percent um, general surgery now. And when you say general surgery, what does that include? So general surgery um, really can include almost any organ system, but typically these days general surgery means uh, a lot of soft tissue such as breast surgery. Um, uh, a lot of intra-abdominal surgery, um, colon or intestinal surgery, um, surgery on the liver, pancreas, spleen. Um, it also can include um, some endocrine operations like the thyroid, uh, parathyroid. Um, and we certainly take emergency call at the hospital um, so that you know any urgent surgical need um, we would address as long as it was within our scope of practice. Okay. And how often do you perform laparoscopic surgery? All the time. Okay. Is that your primary method of performing surgery? Yes, I would say so. Okay. Um, this may be a little difficult for you, but can you tell me percentage-wise how often you're performing laparoscopic surgery versus open surgery? I would say 70 to 80 percent of my operations are laparoscopic versus open. Okay. And where there's an option to do it laparoscopically. Uh, obviously, some surgeries don't have laparoscopic component, uh, you know, a, not a laparoscopic option, so. Sure. Has that been true throughout the entirety of your career to date, or was there a change to laparoscopic at some point? No, I trained in a place that um, was very heavy in laparoscopic training, um, and so when I first came to the area, much of the surgery was being done open, and that was actually I would say a differentiator between myself and, and other surgeons in the area. So um, I was known and still am known as a, a minimally advanced, minimally invasive surgeon or, or laparoscopic surgeon. What percentage of your operations are using Visiport? Today or back in 2013? Um, well, let's go back in 2013. 
At that time, I'd say maybe about 40% of my operation, my entry techniques were busy port. Okay. Has that changed today? Yeah, it's probably dropped to about maybe 10% or less. Okay. Why has it gone down? Mainly because of the types of surgery that I'm doing. Um, in 2013, um, lap band surgery was very popular, and I was doing quite a bit of lap band surgery. Um, I liked using the Visiport because it allowed me to gain access I into the left side of the abdomen where the lap band is, is implanted. Um, and uh, typically there were smaller bariatric patients um, that got the lap band. These days my practice is more, uh, not only morbid obese, but super morbid obese patients. Uh, for those patients, um, I typically find that the um, uh, a particular Visiport trocar isn't long enough for me to gain access to the abdomen um, and uh, I need a longer uh, instrument to be able to gain access to the abdomen. Um, and uh, you know of course I, I had a couple complications with it so you know just as a uh, good measure I want to make sure I'm using a technique that I feel the most comfortable with and uh, I lost a little faith in the Visiport technique after these complications. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, on the last page of your uh, CV, you have some presentations. I don't see any publications. You have a, a separate um, sheet that has publications on it. I haven't published since residency, so okay. Um, have you ever written or given any presentations on the use of the Visiport optical trocar? Um, not specifically the Visiport. I've had people come. Uh, do what we call case observations at my hospital, and I've given presentations on minimally invasive surgery where I may have used it. I, I can't recall at this point. Um, I know early on uh, I was showing individuals how to do lap band implantations, and I'm sure I used a Visiport during that time, but I didn't specifically instruct them on the use of a Visiport specifically. Are you aware of any sort, or could you point me to any sort of literature or publications which you've used in your practice which you believe is reasonably reliable involving insertion techniques with the use of the Visiport trocar? Um, I mean I can't point you to anything. I mean I read the literature, I keep up to um, date on the, both the literature and medical conferences and speaking to other surgeons but I don't have any one specific um, uh, you know piece of literature or textbook that I could point you to. Okay, is there anything that you use in your practice uh, for reference material? Um, again, I use the whole spectrum of uh, available education sources. I go to CMEs, I speak to other surgeons who do this kind of surgery. Um, I will go to manufacturers' um, presentations where they have um, thought leaders present their products. Um, I will certainly speak with reps to see what they're hearing from their surgeons about uh, particular products, you know, good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, and then, you know, I read the medical literature um, and, and whatever potential textbooks, you know, might, might pertain to that subject. Okay. I, I guess what I'm trying to get at, have, have you, do you recall in, since 2013, taking a look at any sort of textbooks involving the use of the Visiport optical trocar? I can't recall at this time. Okay. Have you ever spoken with any medical reps from Covidian or Medtronic regarding the Visiport optical trocar? Yes. Okay. In, in 2013 or since then? Um, let's go to prior to 2013. Did you ever have a rep from Covidian and Medtronic come to Washington Surgical Specialist to talk about the use of the Visiport optical trocar? No, I can say that we had a rep come to Southern Maryland Hospital Center um, talk about the Visiport technique because prior to my expansion of the lap band practice, um, I don't believe Southern Maryland stocked the Visiport, and so uh, the Visiport rep uh, had to come and do an in-service with the staff uh, certainly, I met with the, the rep to, you know, review the product and, and things of that nature. Um, and then since then, I believe I had to do the same thing at Doctors Hospital um, because either they didn't stock it or they didn't keep the right ones in stock. And uh, so I had to reach out to the company rep to, to get the product in the, in the hospital. Okay. Uh, do you remember, not at Doctors, but the first time that they came to Southern Maryland, do you remember what year they may have been in? No idea. Okay. Um, and when the rep came out, um, was, was this a Covidian rep or a Medtronic? I know at one point the company was purchased. Do you recall it all? Yeah, I recall. It would have been a Covidian rep at that time. Okay. 
And do you recall them giving any sort of uh, demonstrations or materials regarding the proper use of the Visiport optical trooper prior to 2013? Right. Um, so I, I certainly got a demo of it, um, which you know came with a package insert. I'm not sure if I reread it at that time or not. Um, I, uh, you know, um, they always give a demonstration, but that's typically just a generic demonstration. It's not a live patient. Um, and they often, um, you know, offer to take you to a, a lunch or a dinner where um, uh, either a physician or, or some senior um, person in their company can further answer questions and, and demo the product if we want that. Um, I don't think I took them up on that offer. Okay. Um, do you remember what literature they may have provided you at that point? I don't recall. Okay. The, uh, do you remember anything about the demonstration they did? Yeah, other than it was very basic, um, you know, they just show the, the different components of the device, you know, how um, it's, it's typically used. Uh, that was the sort of era before, um, you know, video demonstrations and iPads, so they, they would just have to literally show you with their hands and the device. Um, these days when um, products are shown, it's, you know, it usually comes with a video demonstration with, you know, a narrator and, and things of that nature, but at that time it was just something that they would have shown us in, in my office. Okay. Um, do you remember anything about the rep you spoke with? Do you know their name or where they may have come from? Mm, I don't. They change so quick, so frequently. I don't remember who okay. the rep was. And you said recently you had a, another sort of encounter with a rep from, at this point, Medtronic, I believe, at Doctors Community Hospital? No, I've never had a conversation with any Medtronic reps about the Visiport. Um, I've had another conversation with a Covidian rep. It was still Covidian at the time. Okay. But that was maybe in the same time frame. It might still be prior to 2013. This was basically to um, get the product into the hospital so I could use it for my band surgeries over there. Okay. Did they um, give you any sort of demonstration on that occasion as well? No. Okay. Did they provide any sort of literature? No. Okay. That was more of a financial conversation. I see. Okay. Um, how long ago did that meeting take place? Um, if I'm not mistaken, I started doing lap bands at doctors maybe around 2011. So I, it, it's probably still in that pre-2013 time frame. So probably two different occasions that I met with the rep. One for Southern Maryland, one for doctors. And it may be two different reps as well because um, they have different territories sometimes. So I don't know if it was the same rep that I spoke to both times. Do you know the rep that you met with, was that a rep from a certain territory? Yeah, I don't know what their territories are. Okay. Um, so even though doctors in Southern Maryland are only separated by a few, you know, 10, 15 miles, sometimes they may be completely different representatives for the company. Yeah, I, that's why I was asking. I wasn't sure if it was from like the Washington DC area or Virginia. Or I don't think they, it's quite that broad. Usually it's just hospital by hospital. Um, okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> with regards to uh, Miss Wiggins, what did you review in preparation for your deposition here today? Uh, the medical records, and this morning I reviewed this um, package insert from the Visiport. Okay. Um, you said the medical records. Uh, did you review all of the medical records in this case, or just the medical records from when you provided care and treatment to her? Um, the, I focused my attention on um, the office notes that I um, presented to the to my counsel, and then the operative report. The rest of the information I kind of skimmed over, but it was mainly hospital records that I looked at. Okay, uh, and I have to ask this question. It's more of a, a legal question, but do you intend to render any sort of expert opinions in this case, either about standard of care or causation? He's going to testify to what, I think that's a question for me, he's going to testify that what he did was appropriate and within the standard of care as he knew it to be and that um, as you can see in his answers and derogatories, he believes that he has an explanation for why the complication occurred. So if that's what you're asking, yes, he's going to provide that testimony. Okay, and, and if maybe... If that helps you. Well, I guess because there's been a distinction made in the past about whether a defendant is testifying as an expert or simply talking about what they did. Um, well, he, he's testifying as an expert to the extent he has an opinion about what he did and how he did it and what occurred. 
So I think that's fair game, and I think the case law is pretty clear that it's fair game to you to ask him all kinds of questions about, you know, what he did and how he did it and, okay. and whether it was within the standard of care. So I'm certainly not going to put any limitations on you regarding okay. that. Uh, that's fair. And with regards to causation, he's not intending to render any he sort of expert opinions he about does. it. He does. He has an ex he has an a explanation for well, causation to the point as to why there was a complication and what and and that's what I detailed the answers. That's why you detailed the answers in interrogatories. Right, and, and maybe my my question's a little different. Is he going to provide any sort of expert testimony regarding whether the trocar injury led to any sort of specific medical complications that either are or are not related to the trocar injury? He is. I think he's going to say that the complication caused the 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 bleeding and the. Um, um, I mean, that, that's what's in his answers. And I'm not following you. Maybe I'm not. I, I'm, maybe I'm not understanding how you're parsing it out. Okay. Can, can we go off the record just for one second? Because sure. I don't be know good, if all I this has. Okay. Use a bathroom break. Okay. Though. Yeah. <laughs> um, now so that I've had my cup of coffee, I need to. We were going off the record. The time is 11:59 uh, a.m. We are back on the record. The time is 11:10 a.m. All right, doctor. Um, without looking through the medical records, did you have an independent recollection of Renee Wiggins? Yes, I do. Okay, what do you remember about her? Objection to the broad form, but you may answer broadly. Hey, I remember being asked to consult um, on her case when she was admitted to doctor's hospital. She um, had a uh, GYN procedure, and the surgeon um, admitted her to the hospital because she experienced aspiration pneumonia. Um, <clears throat> when I consulted on her, uh, I came to learn that she had a gastric band placed uh, a few years earlier and that uh, she had not been managing her band in any way. Um, and so at that consultation, uh, we emptied her band to see if that would resolve her symptoms and prevent any future aspirations. Uh, I did follow her up you know, through the office um, several times, and she continued to have symptoms related to her band. And ultimately, we scheduled her for surgery, um, and that was at Southern Maryland. And uh, during the entry procedure, as, as you know, we're here to talk about, um, we experienced a complication on entry. Okay. Um, going back to, I think, the first time when you actually had contact with her, was that while she was at Doctors Community Hospital? That's correct. Okay. Um, and were you called in as a consultant at that point? That's right. Okay. Um, and when you saw her, um, did you at that point just say that you wanted to follow up with her outside in, in regular clinic? No, not exactly. I, I provided treatment during that uh, visit. I emptied her gastric band. Okay. Um, so um, that was designed to prevent um, uh, food and acid refluxing into her lungs and her esophagus. Um, and that's essentially a, a treatment to try and see if the patient's symptoms will go away. Okay. Um, in your answers to interrogatories, there was just something that stood out to me. Um, you were asked, <clears> hold <throat> oh, one second, let me just make sure I can find the place here. Do you need this one now? Hmm? If you need this one now. Okay. You can take a look at this if you want to, but I can. What number are you looking interrogatory at? Interrogatory number five. Uh, you were asked if you contended whether a party or person not a party to this action acted in any manner as to cause or contribute to the occurrence referenced in the plaintiff's complaint. And you had mentioned in your answer that you questioned whether Ms. Wiggins was an appropriate candidate for lap band placement initially due to her comorbidities. And uh, I understand that we might not have full discovery on that issue, but can you describe for me what you mean by that? Yes. Um, there are certain indications and contraindications to any procedure, and um, uh, the lap band is, is no different. Um, <clears throat> one of the important things with a gastric band um, is that um, it needs to be maintained regularly. Um, patients will need to follow up with a surgeon uh, familiar with the band. Um, <clears throat> and uh, patients have to be free from any psychiatric disorders. Um, I came to learn that she had uh, schizophrenia with paranoid delusions and, and bipolar disorder. Um, to me, I questioned whether that was uh, appropriate to place a band in a patient like that. Um, in addition, um, she uh, was 
you know, um, financially disadvantaged, so uh, her ability to maintain her vitamin and supplements um, was questionable. Um, you know, um, she also um, complained of uh, what she couldn't really describe very well, but she complained that she had um, prior intestinal problems. And so that's another, you know, sort of red flag to question whether a gastric band is an appropriate uh, surgical technique for this patient. Okay. And I, I just, because I need to know this answer so that I'm clear on what you mean by what well, you're not sure whether she was an appropriate candidate. Are you suggesting that the surgeon who placed the lap band breached the standard of care? I'm suggesting I don't know what he knew at the time and what her particular um, disclosure to him uh, was at the time. If she didn't share this uh, with him or you know anything of that nature, I wouldn't know. I don't know if he sent her to a psychologist, which is typical or in fact required before you place a band. So I didn't have access to this information. She told me that her surgeon had left town. Uh, said he moved to Florida, um, and we attempted to find the surgeon, but we couldn't access any of those records. Okay. If the surgeon did know about the full extent of her psychiatric problem, um, is it your argument that he would have breached standard of care then if he had placed the lap band? Objection form foundation. Yeah, objection form and foundation. I think um, before he's prepared to be definitive about that, he'd want to re review the records, as would we. Okay. So we don't have it. So asking hypotheticals, I think, at this point is premature. But we would reserve the right. That's why we referenced it in the answers and interrogatories. Okay. Well, I guess what I want to know from you here today is, as we sit here today with the information you have available, you are not in a position where you're able to render such an opinion that that physician who placed the lap hand had breached the standard of care. That is correct. I'm not in a position to say whether he did or didn't breach the okay. standard of care. If you reach that opinion at some time in the future, can you please not only supplement your discovery, but let your counsel know so that I know about it so I can ask you some further questions about it? Absolutely. I have no problems with that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> If you can, I'm not sure, because I think our records may be paginated differently. Okay. Um, I would like him to look at, I believe, what is his first encounter note um, as an outpatient with Washington Surgical Specialist. I think that was the one on October the 16th, 2013. It looks like it starts on page, um, hold on a second, zero, 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 one, one. Like yeah, I know it's buried in the, uh, this, this. yeah, there it is. <clears throat> All right, doctor, uh, I am I correct? Is this the, uh, first time that you saw Miss Wiggins as an outpatient after you saw her at Doctors Community Hospital? Yes, I believe this is the first time I saw her as an outpatient, yes. Okay. And it looks like on this occasion you conducted a physical examination and also gathered a patient history, including a surgical history? Yes. Okay. Um, is a patient's surgical history important prior to determining what sort of laparoscopic procedure you would perform in removing a lap band? In addition to many other factors, yes, a surgical history is important. Okay. Can you tell me why it would be important? Well, certainly we would want to know what kind of an implant she has, uh, what the technique was to implant it, um, uh, where the port was placed after the implantation of the, of the band, um, you know, uh, if she had any revisional procedures done after that, if she had any surgery done prior to that, which may 
um, alter um, her internal anatomy. Okay. And I'm trying to find here the uh, the page with the list of surgical procedures that she wrote down for you. Just bear with me one second here. All right, so if you look at page 0, 0, 0, 0, 0009 and 0, 0, 0, 0010. <clears throat> Is this where she wrote down for you her uh, list of prior surgeries? Yes, it starts, um, as you said, on page 9, um, and then it uh, extends on to the following page. Okay. Um, of those procedures that she wrote down, um, were any of them performed laparoscopically? Well, certainly the lap band was performed laparoscopically. Um, <clears throat> tubal ligation uh, was also performed laparoscopically, uh, although she didn't indicate it, but that's, that was my understanding as it was done laparoscopically. Um, and I'm unclear as to whether her fibroid and hysterectomy surgery was done laparoscopically, but I know at least the band and the tubal ligation were. Okay. With regards to the uh, hysterectomy that was done in September 2013, um, at the time that you were planning to perform the lap band removal, um, did you know anything about that procedure? Could you repeat the question? Sure. Um, at the time that you were planning how you were going to proceed with the lap band removal, um, did you know anything about the way the hysterectomy had been performed in yeah, September 2013? Yes, when I did my consult at, at Doctors Community Hospital. That was immediately following her surgery, and so I had access to speak to the surgeon and also to examine her and, and see, you know, what what they did to get in and, and those types of things. Yes. Okay. And I uh, think you had said though that you weren't sure whether it was performed laparoscopically. Well, looking at this, I wasn't sure, you know, because she didn't list it as laparoscopic. But in my recollection, is it was done laparoscopic. Okay. Um, do you know anything about the place of entry? I believe they used midline technique to get in midline uh, just above the umbilicus. Okay. Do you know whether or not they used the visiport? I don't know. Okay. Have you reviewed in preparation for your deposition here today the operative note for that procedure? I didn't look at that particular operative note. Okay. I could look at it now if you'd like. Well, I'm just asking, have you ever seen it? I have seen it, yes. Okay. Do you know whether the visiport was used? I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Do you know whether prior CO2 insufflation had been used? Ever? Like well, prior? No, uh, for that procedure on uh, September 13, 2013. How they, what, what technique they used and whether or not they used CO2? I'm sorry, I'm not following your question. I'm not trying to be difficult. Well, right. Uh, when they were using the trocar to enter the abdomen, did they use prior CO2 insufflation before using the trocar to enter the abdomen through the midline? You're talking about the hysterectomy? Right. Where he wasn't present? You can answer if you know. I mean, I, I, would, I would really like to review the op note. I could tell you exactly what they did, and I would have known that at the time after reviewing, you know, the, um, the operative note, but I can't recall right this okay. second because I don't remember the whole record. Well, you said it's 10,000 pages. Yeah, no, I, I get you. Um, well, let me ask you this. Does it make a difference, did it make a difference for your decision to <clears throat> perform the lap band procedure in the way that you did, that they had entered the midline in September 2013 for the hysterectomy? It didn't significantly change my uh, entry approach. Um, since they did violate the midline, that would be an area that had previously been operated on. You would tend to want to avoid that area. Um, but that's not an absolute, um, you know, certainly with careful dissection, you can reuse that um, midline technique. But uh, the, the reason to use um, an off-center or paramedian, we call it, um, entry point would be to get the best uh, optimal visualization of the operative field. They were operating straight down in the middle of the pelvis. I was going to be operating into the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. So um, that has probably the most um, to do with the placement where, where we actually decide to place the port. And in terms of whether they used insufflation or varus needle, um, that doesn't 
really point me in one direction or another. That, again, that's surgeon preference. That surgeon likes to use that technique. He probably uses that all the time, and that's what he chose to use for, for his own comfort. Um, I used the technique that I thought that were, worked best for that particular operation for me. I guess I'd like to know all the reasons, if, unless you've told me all the reasons, that you chose the insertion point that you chose. Um, so yes, uh, the major reason is the best visualization so that you know we can get a good view into the left upper quadrant. Uh, we are, and this is a reoperative surgery, so we're anticipating scar tissue. Um, and uh, she had just recently had surgery in the midline, so that scar tissue would be obscuring our view if we went through the midline again. Uh, plus, uh, a freshly operated area is going to have uh, a large amount of inflammation and reaction that can cause the bowel to stick up to that area, so that increases the likelihood of uh, a complication where the bowel um, is um, lacerated. Um, <clears throat> and uh, of course, um, uh, you know, the, the final thing is, is um, we are going to be removing a band. Um, and when you remove a band, you have to have an appropriately sized removal um, incision. Um, and I like to keep mine off the midline because they tend to heal better after the surgery. So those were the major factors. You know, I, there might be other minor factors, but you know, those are the ones that um, are fresh in my mind right now. What were the alternatives to using the uh, left of the, you said it was the paramedian? Yeah, it's a left paramedian incision. Okay. Um, what were the other alternative entry sites besides, I know the midline, but besides that, what were the other options that you could have used as the insertion point? Well, so in terms of entry points, you can enter the abdomen almost anywhere. Um, uh, and you can use any size entry device from a needle to a five millimeter port up to a, a 12 millimeter visi port. Um, your place of entry is determined by really the procedure that you're gonna do. Um, so some surgeons will make a, an entry site in an area that they feel comfortable with uh, and never use that for their operation, but that's relatively inefficient. It gives the patient an extra incision with the potential complications of that incision, you know, poor wound healing, hematoma, all those things. So we try and minimize the number of incisions. This is a minimally invasive surgery. So we try and use one incision point where you can get a good entry and retrieval of the band and then your other ports will be um, aligned or you know um, placed based on that initial one. So initially, I wanted to get the best access to the band with the fewest uh, adhesions in my way, and have the um, area where I could remove the band and, and sew it up and allow it to heal the best. Was any consideration given to using some sort of subcostal uh, insertion point, like the Palmer's point? Yeah, so Palmer's point is contraindicated in people who've had gastric surgery, and lap band is a type of gastric surgery. So again, um, a band very specifically, even compared to other gastric surgeries, creates a significant foreign body reaction. There's silicone and, and plastic you know, that's used to, to make the band, and <clears throat> that creates a pretty significant um, inflammatory response, which leads to adhesions. So the stomach typically would be right under there. Palmer's point insertion is, is excellent if you have a relatively virgin abdomen. Um, and the, the reason why people tend to like that one is because the fixation of the rib cage allows the fascia to be controlled. That was the sort of concept that I was mentioning earlier, where the fascia doesn't move around as much in that location. But it's not a good spot to go in if you're going to do gastric surgery, number one. And you'll never be able to see what you want to see because you're too close to the target anatomy. You need to be further away so that you can visualize the target anatomy. In the uh, Washington Surgical Specialist records, I think there actually is the operative note from the 2006 lap band procedure. Did you see that in your review of the records? Yes. OK. Um, where was the insertion point? Well, first of all, was a visiport trocar used in that procedure? And I think we're on trying to get to the page here. Yeah, if you can point me to the page. Um, page five. I mean, that's uh, the second page of the operative, and the first page is. Uh, is it SMHC five or? No, that's uh, zero, 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 Go back to zero, yours, page. To mine, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean five, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it starts on four, okay. Mm -hmm. 
just let me know when you're uh, mm -hmm. oriented there. Okay. Yep. Uh, um, so your question again, I apologize, could you repeat it? Sure. Was the uh, VisiPort trail car used on that occasion? Yes. Okay. And what was the insertion point? Um, so I, I put left subcostal, which is essentially the same thing as left paramedian. Um, it wasn't immediately under the rib cage. Okay. And you said you put, th this is in your operative note though, right? Yes. It's the other doctor's mm -hmm. operative note. Are you looking at it? This yours? is mine, right? Oh, this is Dr. Pinar's. Okay. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. So, uh, well, then I, you would certainly, Dr. Pinar would have to comment what he meant by left subcostal, but certainly anywhere below the left rib cage is subcostal. So it could be from the belly button up okay. to the rib cage. So whether he's calling it immediately subcostal or paramedian, I think you would have to comment on that. Okay, so you're not sure from that description what that's actually referring to. You don't know if that's Palmer's point or not. That's correct. I don't know if that's Palmer's point or not. Okay. Is your understanding that that could actually mean left paramedian as well? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in your, I'm sorry, I'm shifting back and forth here. Okay. Um, in your, well, Never mind. Going back to your original note with the, uh, the history that you have, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you had a discussion with Ms. Wiggins regarding the uh, risk benefits and alternatives of the procedure. Can you tell me what that conversation consisted of since risk benefits alternatives is a little vague? Sure. Um, so initially I um, explained to her that her symptoms, her persistent symptoms of, of reflux and potential night coughs and, you know, these aspiration symptoms uh, were likely related to uh, the band causing obstruction. So um, the acid in the food that she eats, uh, the liquids in the foods that she eats, excuse me, um, were not passing through the band efficiently and they were coming back up. So in order to alleviate that, we could give her more time to see if she, and so this is the sort of alternatives uh, that I'm giving her at this point, we could give her more time to see if uh, more healing could occur and maybe her esophagus may recover more, um, we call motility, the ability to propel food through. Um, and healing does happen in some of these cases. Um, and uh, so that was sort of the uh, non-operative option that I gave her, which is, you know, we don't do anything right now. We can just, you know, see if things heal up and, you know, you have that option. Or, alternatively, we could go in, we could either remove the band or try and revise the band. Um, I did advise her that I didn't think a revision of the band was appropriate, um, given the fact that I had reservations that she should have a band at all. So I, I really strongly recommended that she either live with her symptoms, which can be managed with, you know, medications, or we could proceed to surgery. Um, and then I went on to explain the operation, that it could be done laparoscopically. She was uh, under the impression that it had to be an open operation. I explained to her that, um, you know, even though it was a reoperation, it could be done laparoscopically. Um, there's always a chance of conversion to open, um, but that, you know, most of these cases can be completed laparoscopically. Um, <clears throat> and then um, uh, went through, you know, basically the risks of the operation, the things that I always mention, things like infection, uh, number one, both at the external surgical sites and internally at the organ space. Uh, and the second thing I always mention is bleeding, um, and bleeding certainly that could be again in the subcutaneous space around the incisions, or it could be at any of the um, internal organ space sites, you know, next to the spleen, next to the stomach. Uh, and then I talked about you know, inadvertent injury to or you know um, laceration of an internal organ. So uh, we talked about, as I mentioned earlier, uh, solid organs such as the spleen, liver. Uh, the hollow organs such as the intestines and the stomach, and then also the vascular structures. Okay. <clears throat> Did you uh, specifically have a discussion with her about... Were you done your answer? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure. I'm oh, sorry. you looked like you had stopped talking. It, yes. it, he stopped talking. I didn't know it was take a breath or not, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm um, done. Did you I always have, like to check. <laughs> Did you have any discussion with her specifically about the um, use of trocar that you would use or might use? and? Um, how you would perform the procedure? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, and that's that's 
fairly common. Uh, we don't we don't talk about very specifics of the operation, just the general nature of whether we're going to do open or laparoscopic. Okay. And she signed a consent form at that time? Not at that visit. Okay. Did anybody go to that visit with her? No, she made her visit by herself. Okay. And it looks well, like... Me, if I can clarify my answer. Sure. Nobody came back to the exam room with her. If there was somebody in the waiting room, I wouldn't know that. But there okay. was nobody in the exam room. Okay. And I'm assuming at that point she chose to proceed with the operation? That's right. She really didn't um, want to have the band in anymore. She didn't feel like it was helping her and it was just causing more trouble. Okay. Um, I'm trying, I didn't see in your notes where you had any real contact with her then between then and when you performed the operation. Is, is that correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was reading. Right. Did, did you have any other um, uh, encounters with her between that October visit and when you ended up performing the operation? No, I don't recall any other. Okay. I just was clarifying. I'm not trying yes. to be tricky. I mm -hmm. just no, I don't it. recall okay. anything else. All right. Um, if we can take a look then at your operative note, I have no idea what, how it's paginated in your yeah, records. I think we have a Southern Maryland chart here. Yeah, if you look on the very front, there's an uh, index, and that should tell you where the operative report is. I don't remember the page off the top of my head, but it operative should be. Operative report 10, C10. Yeah, so C10. Oh, somebody even put operative note right here. There you go. That's so I could find it. <laughs> should, I should have just started with the yellow tab. <laughs> All right, so uh, looking at the very top of the page here where it says um, <clears throat> preoperative diagnosis complications of gastric band. Do you see where it says that? Yes. Okay. We're just going to kind of walk through your operative note then. You can, I'm going to ask you some questions as we go, okay? Sure. Um, so I, I know that you had, you kind of gave me the reasons why you chose the insertion point. Um, I want you to tell me a little bit about the, the anatomy of the abdominal wall. Um, first of all, at the place where you inserted the trochar, can you tell me what the layers of the abdominal wall are? Sure. Um, so uh, starting from the outside, you'll of course have skin. Underneath uh, the skin, there's a layer of subcutaneous tissue, subcutaneous fat. Um, and within that subcutaneous fat, there is a very thin layer. Uh, we call it scarpa's fascia. Some people can't even identify that as a tissue layer sometimes because it's very thin. And then you will see the first of the fascial layers that um, surrounds the rectus muscle that we refer to that the um, anterior rectus sheath or, or um, uh, you know, rectus sheath. Then there's the rectus muscle, which is sandwiched in between two of those fascial layers. And then we have the posterior rectus sheath which is right above the, we call it the peritoneum, which is the lining of the abdomen. And then after that, you're inside the abdomen. Okay. Um, with the, I, what other insertion points did you consider for Ms. Wiggins prior to performing this procedure, before you made your selection of the left paramedian insertion point? The only one that I would have considered would have been a midline, um, because any other incision would have been very difficult to see the operative field. Okay. Um, can you describe for me what the walls of the abdo abdomen are like in the midline? So the midline really has a, a single layer of fascia. We call it the linea alba. That's where the anterior and posterior fascia layers fuse together, and it's essentially one layer. Um, and then there's peritoneum directly underneath that. Okay. So would you agree with me that there's less layers to go through in the midline? That's correct. Okay. And. I know you said that medicine is an art, but I'm going to ask you to be a little bit of an artist for me here today if you okay. can. I'm not holding you to any sort of high standard. So <clears throat> what I'd like you to do is if you could draw for me kind of the abdomen, the umbilicus, and just draw where you think you put your incision point, okay? So draw an abdomen and... Right. Okay. Right. Basic picture. Like I said, I'm, I'm not pen? holding you to the specific... Mm -hmm point per se, but I want you to put it in the location you think it was. <coughs> so this would be the patient's right, patient's left. I'm going to 
So I write the word incision there? Sure. Okay. So it's, um, I think, uh, that, is that my mm -hmm. pen? Oh, sure. Yep, sorry. All right. So it was not directly left of the midline, but it was also left and slightly above the That's midline? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you tell me how far the incision was from the midline? Um, how far left of the midline was it? One to two centimeters. Okay. And can you draw for me the aorta and the iliac arteries? I can track. <clears throat> I'll object to the use of the anatomic uh, location based on uh, these drawings as opposed to what her anatomy would have been, but you can go ahead and do this exercise of drawing. So typically, um, and again this is really a, a general um, sure. understanding of the anatomy, her anatomy can certainly be altered, but Normally the aorta comes down to somewhere in the region of the umbilicus and begins to bifurcate um, into the two iliac arteries. Okay. We'll have this marked as exhibit two. Um, did, since you obviously have performed surgery on Ms. Wiggins, um, do you believe that she had any abnormal anatomy? Yes. Okay, what was abnormal about it? Um, in her abdominal wall, um, it was definitely abnormal. So um, when I went through and I realized that I had lacerated the, the vessel below, we of course opened. Uh, once we opened, I was then able to insert my index finger through that um, trocar opening. And I could see she had almost no posterior rectus sheath. Um, it was either damage from her prior surgery or from infection uh, or something of that nature. So essentially what happened is we uh, incised the anterior rectus sheath, went through the rectus muscle, and we were basically right on top of peritoneum and, and abdominal organs at that point. There's really very little um, posterior fascia in that location. And, and again, she's had multiple prior operations. Uh, and. I wasn't aware of any history of infection, but certainly infection can set in in those um, uh, incisions, and it can we call it necrose the fascia. It just simply dies off, and then it gets replaced by scar tissue, and sometimes it's just an empty space. Uh, normally, we would be able to see a um, if it was a full abdominal uh, defect, we would be able to see a hernia in that location. She did not have a hernia, but that's because the anterior layer was completely intact. Okay. Um, can you tell me where is the um, aorta and the iliac arteries in relation to the the skin and the abdominal wall? Are they is there organs between the abdominal wall and where the arteries are? Sometimes. Um, so uh, again, the the abdominal wall and also the abdominal contents are mobile. Um, they, they flex, they move, the intestines can move around. So the aorta is essentially sandwiched between the abdominal wall um, and the spine. Uh, and it's just off to the side of it, slightly off to the side of it. And so sometimes you may not have absolutely no organs in between. You may have the, the mesentery, the small bowel, which is, which is, I guess you could call that an organ, but it's just a very thin layer of blood vessels and fat. Um, and the size of that depends on the individual patient. But you may have nothing between the bottom of the abdominal wall and the aorta other than th that thin layer. Other times you may have multiple loops of small bowel uh, sitting in between those two layers. Um, if you're going through the midline, you really shouldn't see any solid organs in that area. But for example, if you were um, you know, higher up, you would have um, the duodenum, you would have pancreas and, and different organs like that that would overlie the aorta. So the aorta in the region of the umbilicus, if a patient is laying flat and their um, intestines have shifted off to the side because, um, you know, there's a lot of room now in that abdomen, uh, and certainly in her case there certainly would be that room because she was once obese, had a big abdominal cavity, and then now she's lost the weight. and so. 
the intestines may settle off to the side. So in her case, um, probably there's little to no tissue in between the back of the abdominal wall and the air aorta. Okay. Um, was Miss Wiggins obese when you saw her on December the 10th, 2013? Yes, sure. her BMI was about 38, 39. Okay. Do um, you remember round about how much she weighed at that point? Um, I, I don't remember her weight um, exactly, but I, I, as a surge, bariatric surgeon, we tend to go by body mass index, and, okay. and that tells us whether somebody's obese or not. And a body mass index of 38 is certainly in the severely obese range. From your recollection, did she have a lot of fat in her abdomen? My recollection is she had a very floppy abdomen, um, and so she um, had a lot of fat before at one point. You could certainly tell that from the fact that now her skin and tissues were sagging and floppy. Um, but um, how much fat she had internally is, is very difficult to tell, um, even with CT scans, because um, they, don't, they don't always give you an accurate estimate of the intra-abdominal fat. Have you ever read any sort of literature indicating that the risk of vascular complications with the use of the Visiport optical trocar is less in people who are, are obese? Yes. Uh, well, I know as a general rule, I'm not sure if I know any literature to that, but as a general rule from my experience, yes, it's less if people are obese. <clears throat> All right. Um, so what I want to actually do is uh, looking at this, um, your operative note, and actually... <clears throat> I brought the busy port choker with me, so I actually have it. Okay. So um, what I actually would like you to do is show me kind of how you had it positioned and how you used it to go through the abdomen. Okay. okay. Can I have a minute to review this? Now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can we go off the record while he's reviewing that? I could use the restroom again. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. It's my morning run. We're going off the record. The time is 11:46 a.m. We're back on the record. The time is 12:01 p.m. All right, doctor. Um, we have the uh, the Visiport Troker here. Um, can you first, uh, if you would like, to just kind of describe what those two components are? Okay. Yeah, and I'll just object generically because obviously there's not a patient here, and obviously the patient, um, and I'm not sitting up on this table for anybody to see my abdomen today, um, but. Um, and it's not Miss Wiggins, obviously, it can't right, be, but right. uh, for purposes of demonstration, I'll let you do it, but just understand that it's limited by sure. the fact that we're in a conference room and not in a surgery and with no patient. Mm -hmm. So You can come up on the table if you'd like. I, that's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the system has two components, um, and this is, um, we kind of refer to it as the gun. Um, it's got a trigger. Uh, which activates a knife at the tip of this um, shaft here. Um, it's designed, it's got an opening in the back of it so that a laparoscope can be inserted. A uh, 10 millimeter laparoscope typically t is inserted here. The laparoscope will go all the way down to the tip um, and the light that comes on the laparoscope will allow uh, visualization through this clear plastic tip. This is designed to go into the port. This is the part that's going to remain behind in the patient, and it's our um, continuous access point to the uh, patient's abdomen so that we can insert and remove uh, instruments. Um, we can certainly put uh, video camera and you know other instruments required for the surgery. So at the outset of the operation, this um, is inserted as such, so you can still see this clear plastic tip out of the back. Um, we don't have a laparoscope, but a laparoscope would be coming out of the back. The laparoscope is attached to a video system, so we're monitoring everything that's happening at the tip on a video screen, which is just off to the side of the surgical field. It's not a sterile uh, component. It's electronic, so we can't include that in the field. But it's sort of sitting um, in, in, for example, a case like a lap band would be sitting close to the patient's head off to their shoulder, either the left or right, depending on the side. Uh, that the surgeon's on, so it has to be opposite of the surgeon's side. Um, and basically, um, once you assemble all of that, um, you would make a skin incision in the patient's abdomen at your preferred entry site. Uh, then you would um, insert this tip through the skin incision and you would um, just 
fairly easily be able to blunt through the uh, fairly easily dissect through the blunt subcutaneous fat. Um, it doesn't offer much resistance. And so you can just kind of push through and of course at this time you're visualizing what you're seeing on the screen and you typically go down in until you see um, the anterior rectus sheath or the fascia. Sometimes you do have to activate the blade in the subcutaneous fat if it's there, if there's a lot of it or if it's just um, a lot of uh, thick tissue in that area maybe from scar tissue or something else. Um, so those are the components. Okay. Uh, let me ask you a little bit about Ms. Wiggins here. So um, it said you, I'm looking at uh, the second page of your operative note uh, where it says procedure and um, the third sentence down, just skipping over a few mm -hmm. things. Um, it says a left midline incision was made and a visiport was inserted. Yeah, you misread that. It says left mid abdominal oh, I'm incision. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Left mid abdominal incision was made and a visiport was inserted. It said using good visualization, we were able to in to see the anterior fascia divided um, at to up to that point, were you firing the visiport trocar at all? I mean, I can't recall. I wouldn't dictate that separately if I had to fire through the subcutaneous tissue. Um, uh, so I, I don't know at this time. You know, it's a long time ago since the surgery. Okay, and you can see because there's a camera in the visiport trocar, you can actually physically see each layer as you're going through it. Correct. That is the, that's the reason why I use it, is so that you can visualize the tissue layers, yes. Okay. Can you see when the blade is fired? You don't see the blade itself, but you see the tissue responding to the blade being activated. So, for example, if you were pushing, um, gently pushing into a tissue plane and it doesn't give, if it doesn't separate, um, you'll feel resistance, and then when you activate the blade, several things will be noticed. Number one, you'll notice the loss of that resistance to the to the pressure that you're applying and you know you should see the tip move down a little bit on your screen you should see the tissues divide um, if you were to look at the camera view there's actually a line which corresponds to the um, line at the tip here um, and that line is the line at which the tissues will separate so you're looking you're paying attention to that line seeing how the tissues are responding to your activation of the trigger okay um when you're using the the blunt dissection, do you have to twist the trocar in any manner in order to go through the different layers? Yes, typically you, you sort of wiggle it is what we call it. You, you twist it back and forth to kind of bluntly dissect through the tissue. Um, and then um, once you arrive at sufficient resistance where that, that kind of um, gentle blunt dissection isn't working, then you kind of release, you know, you have to apply a little bit of pressure so that it opposes the tissue. It, it's on the tissue, but you don't, you know, really push. You just kind of put it on the tissue, and then you activate the trigger to cut that tissue. At what layer, do you, wh which layer is the, the layer where you typically get that resistance, where you would have to then switch over to the blade? Typically it's the anterior rectus sheath. Okay. Is that what you recall happening in Ms. Wiggins' case? Yes, I mean, so whether I fired in the subcutaneous tissue or not, I, I don't really know, but the, the real thing that I'm looking for is where is that anterior um, rectus sheath? And when, once I see that, and it's gonna have a significantly different appearance in the camera view. Um, subcutaneous fat is yellow, and it looks like little, you know, tiny marbles, if you will. Um, and uh, fascia um, will be white, and it's very, um, it, it almost looks like um, like something woven, like woven cloth a little bit. Uh, so it has a significantly different appearance and uh, as soon as you see that then you know that you're in a layer that you're not going to be able to bluntly dissect through and that's when you have to activate it. Okay, so going blade. back to uh, Miss Wiggins again, um, you obviously went through the skin, you went through the subcutaneous fat yes. and you recall seeing that layer, correct? Yes. Okay, and that layer looked the way you would expect it to look? The subcutaneous fat? Right. Yes. Okay. Um, and then the next layer after that um, is what? The anterior rectus sheath. Okay. And that's that woven cloth appearance? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did that look the way you expected you it to, to look? You have to say yes. The, the Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it did. <laughs> okay. Um, and at that, up until that point, at least according to your notes, you can't tell whether or not you fired the blade at all, correct? Um, I don't know if I fired in the subcutaneous fat, but I know I fired on the anterior uh, rectus sheath. Would you agree with me that, at least according to 
I believe the manufacturer insert um, that you're not supposed to ever fire the visiport blade without being sure of where you are in the patient's body. Do you want to point to what section you're talking sure, about? Sure, we can here, give me it. The print's so small I can't see it. I know, and I was thinking about making a copy for it today, but it doesn't come out very well because it's so small. It's crazy small. I didn't even think they made font that small. <clears throat> I can't see it with my glasses on. I wouldn't be able to see that either. Even with my glasses on. No, there's no circumstance under French. which I can read that. Yeah. yeah, it's right under the pictures. On the uh, it's right under the diagrams on the other side that you're looking it's at. Every it says language en for in English. The just underneath it on the flap. Oh, here we go. It. All right. <clears throat> So it says, warning, do not squeeze the trigger if the location of the Visiport Plus optical trigger has not or cannot be determined. Failure to confirm the location of the Visiport Plus optical trigger after each blade actuation may increase the risk of injury. Yes, I'm aware of that. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm assuming that if you had fired the blade at that point, you had felt confident that you were 100% sure of where you were in the patient's body? Objection. Objection to form and foundation and 100% sure and all of those things because they're not relative to how surgeons do their positioning. But you may answer generically the and question. And I'm joining in that objection. So um, when I fired, whether that first time was in the subcutaneous space or on the anterior fascia, I was confident that I was in the right space when I fired the trigger. Okay. And that was based upon the way it looked looking at through the camera? As I said, a combination of factors, um, where um, what things look like through the camera view, the resistance that I was feeling. Um, you can also uh, sometimes tell uh, if you are um, happen to look down or if you decide to look down, you might be able to tell where you are based on the depth. Um, certainly if you are very deep onto the shaft here uh, and you think you're still in a subcutaneous space, either it's a really large patient or you might be in the wrong space, so it takes away from your level of confidence. Doesn't mean you're in the wrong spot, just you know, means you have to think it over again and make sure that you know, before you actuate that you're in the right space. But based on all the factors at that time, I was pretty confident when I was firing on the anterior fascia. Okay. And after you go through the anterior fascia, what's the next layer that you encounter? It looks like the muscle layer? That's correct, the rectus muscle. Okay, and what did that look like? So muscle fibers will be red um, versus the white of the fascia, so it's a distinctly different picture. Um, muscle fibers run lengthwise up and down the abdomen, so you see sort of these red strings maybe is, is a good word. It's not really thin like a string, but sort of these little red fibers uh, that you'll see running up and down. And uh, typically um, you can push through that and the muscle fibers will separate without much uh, pressure. Occasionally the muscle fibers are very well developed and very thick so sometimes you do have to activate the muscle in that space as well. Okay, and it looks like you didn't actually, you, you went through that bluntly. Correct? That's correct. Okay. And then it, it, it indicates the posterior fascia was then identified how did you identify the posterior fascia? Again, the same way I did with the anterior fascia. You would expect a change in the color uh, is the most important thing. So you're going to go from seeing red in your camera view. As the muscle bluntly splits apart, you're going to see um, a white um, fibrous layer again. And um, you know, at that point, you should feel some resistance to what you're pushing against. OK. And I'm assuming you saw a white fibrous layer at that point? That's correct. Okay. And you also felt that there was resistance? Yes. Okay. Did you, at this point, when you're entering the abdomen, did you see any evidence of any adhesions? Well, we, I didn't think I was in the abdomen at this point. Oh, okay. Well, the abdominal wall, did you see any evidence of scar tissue adhesions, anything like that? Scar tissue within the abdominal wall right. itself? I don't recall seeing any adhesions. I don't, I'm pretty sure there were none. Okay. Prior to inserting the uh, 
at Busy Port and doing this procedure, did you palpate the patient's abdomen to see if you could feel the aorta pulse? Um, I don't recall whether I did or not. Okay. Have you ever um, seen any sort of uh, description of, of either from the manufacturer of Visiport or in, in any other literature where that is something that should be done prior to using the Visiport? So that's a technique that we learn throughout our training. You know, if you are, uh, ex you certainly want to examine and palpate the abdomen as you begin an operation. That's sort of the first thing that you do. You inspect and, and palpate. Um, now, when you're doing that, you typically don't feel the aortic pulsation, especially in obese patients. So um, that's something that most bariatric surgeons have abandoned is doing on a regular basis. You know, if it's a thinner patient, you're worried about where is the aorta in relation to where my incision is about to go, then certainly I would do that. But in a patient like Ms. Wiggins, um, it, it didn't occur to me to do that because it didn't, I didn't think there was going to be so little space in the abdomen. Okay. Would you agree with me that if you had insufflated with CO2 prior to using the Visiport trocar that you would have created more space because of the CO2 in the abdomen between the abdominal wall and where the organs were? Yeah, if I was able to successfully enter and insufflate the abdomen, that would have created more space, yes. Okay. But you could have also done that using a varus needle prior to even using the Visiport optical trocar to enter the abdomen, correct? Yes, you can do that. Okay. Would that have potentially decreased the risk of a vascular complication using the Visiport optical trocar if you had already insufflated with the CO2? Well, it doesn't eliminate the risk of that blind pass. Any, any way you slice it, whether you're going to use the Visiport after you insufflate the abdomen or some other device to get in the abdomen, it's that initial blind pass that is the risk factor in, in a varus technique or, a, a, you know, when you insufflate. So um, it doesn't eliminate that risk. Um, and so whether you insufflate before or after really is a matter of whether you think you can visualize, uh, whether you believe that visualizing the layers as you go through is more beneficial than creating the space. So there's safety in seeing the, the various layers and there's safety in creating the space. It's the surgeon's judgment to determine which one of those factors he wants to go with. If it's uh, a patient, as we had mentioned, uh, Ms. Um, Wiggins here, who is obese, one would expect that there's a decent amount of space in the abdomen, so creating more space doesn't necessarily create much more safety, but visualizing the tissue layers in somebody who's had previous surgery is a, is a significant benefit. So. I guess that I don't know how to, better to answer your question, but I think that's that's my thought process is that it's better to see as you're going in rather than just blindly pass um, a needle into the abdomen. Well, and, and I understand that's the the potential risk using the varus needle, you know, blindly inserting it into the abdomen. But if you had used the varus needle, had insufflated the abdomen, you know, you did not have any sort of complications because of the blind insertion would the risk of a vascular complication at that point then, after the CO2 insufflation has already been done, be less with the Visiport optical choker because you had now created that space with CO2? Objection to the hypothetical calls for speculation and you're suggesting there would not have been any kind of com complication with the No, insertion? I'm not saying it would not have been any sort of complication. I just asked him, would the risk have if decreased? You're assuming that you didn't have a complication with the part that you have a complication with, that's what you're asking? Well, now you lost me. Uh, well, I think he's testified that the varus needle, the time that you're going to have a complication with it is when you're actually inserting it. So you're asking him to assume hypothetically that he d would not have had a complication? Correct. It, so we're, we're taking it one step further. I think he may understand what I'm asking. I understand him. what he's asking. Um, I know, but I, yeah. I, I'll object to the, the hypothetical, particularly the hypothetical that is assuming you don't have a complication at the time you would have a complication. So, but I don't think that's a fair question, but you may answer. Yeah, I mean, so I think in my prior response, I, I said just that. If you can get beyond the insertion blindly and you can successfully insufflate the abdomen, at that point it is safer. At that point you really don't even need a Visiport. You could simply, you know, 
uh, use a, a different kind of optical trocar. You could even, some surgeons even blindly go in and, and, and insert a port without visualizing with the laparoscope. So yes, once you get beyond that initial risk of the blind pass and you're able to successfully insulate the abdomen, everything you do from that point is slightly safer because you've got more space. Okay. Um, if you were going to insufflate Ms. Wiggins with the varus needle, where would you have put the varus needle? In the same incision um, as I would be inserting my trocar, my first trocar. Okay, understood. Um, up until the point where you got to the um, posterior fascia, um, how much pressure, if you can recall, did you have to apply to get to that point? Yeah, I recall this case because as soon as um, we, we saw the blood, uh, you know, I of course thought back on you know those types of things. I don't. I, I recall that I did not have to use excessive pressure to get through the tissue layers. Um, this was um, less pressure, or at, at the worst, the you know e equivalent pressure to what I would normally apply um, in getting into the abdomen with this kind of a technique. And when you're entering the abdomen with the trocar, is it? Can you tell me, do you go down perpendicular, or is it from an angle? Can you kind of describe how you're using it to enter the abdomen? Generically, or in her case? Well, in, in her case. In her case, I remember going perpendicular to the, to the abdominal wall. OK. Um, is that what you would do in every case, or does your decision whether to go perpendicular change based upon the patient? It changes okay. based upon the patient. What are the factors that you consider in making that decision? Uh, again, you know, sort of every case is different. Um, if we are doing a case where um, the patient has a very thick abdominal wall and a perpendicular entry would result in basically the, the port buried and, and you don't have much mobility, we're certainly not going to be able to operate on somebody's target anatomy if it's way up here. So in, in certain cases, you would go through a slightly angulated um, orientation so that the port will have an angulated approach into the abdomen so that you can put the um, camera in and see the area that you're going into. Uh, in her case, um, there was nothing that led me to believe that, you know, she was going to have um, a really thick abdominal wall that we needed to go through. My, my standard, if you will, uh, I would say the majority of the time, it's perpendicular. It's very rare that I go through at an angle. Okay. Um, you, you said in her case, though, you didn't think there would be uh, a very thick abdominal wall? Mm hmm Okay. But I thought... Say yes. Yes. I, I thought you had told... Maybe a misunderstanding of your testimony. I thought you had told me earlier that the reason that you felt safe doing it with the Visiport optical choker and not the varus needle was because she did have a thick abdominal wall because she was obese. No, I said she was obese. I, I don't remember saying the word thick abdominal wall in the past. Uh, I don't, don't recall that. Um, okay. No, sorry. So the, the thing about obesity that I, I should explain is what the differences are here. Obesity is just the general condition of having too much fat on your body. That fat can be under the skin, subcutaneous fat, or it can be inside the abdomen, ab abdominal obesity, or it can be down in the thighs. Um, and a person's body mass index doesn't tell you that number by itself doesn't tell you where their fat has been deposited. So as a surgeon, you have to, as we talked about, inspect the abdomen, palpate the abdomen, and see exactly um, you know, where you think the fat is going to be. Um, you can have some guidelines with CT scans and things like that, but ultimately it's, it's you know, the surgeon's you know, physical exam and impression of the, the dynamics of the abdominal wall. What I do remember saying earlier is that her abdominal wall was very floppy because she at, at one point had a much bigger abdomen. She uh, very likely had a lot of abdominal obesity at that point. And that abdominal obesity improved with her lap band surgery. And now the abdominal wall, which doesn't bounce back, it doesn't return back to you know, sort of a normal size, is still very voluminous and very floppy. So now that's different from thickness. Now if she had a lot of fat under the skin, that would make the thickness of her abdominal wall quite large. Okay. Well, did that did that factor into your decision making with whether to use the Visiport optical trocar or the varus needle? Did you think that she had more fat in her abdominal wall, which provided you with a little bit of an extra cushion when you're going through? That may have um, made it less likely that you would cause some sort of injury. 
objection to forming foundation, and I think it's, in, you may answer. So a thick abdominal wall doesn't provide you any benefits uh, in terms of preventing injury. In fact, it might make it more difficult to get in because you have to work through a much deeper layer of tissue to actually gain entry into the peritoneal cavity, into the abdomen. And by doing that, you may actually, again, the tissue is, has solid and fluid components. So as you're going in, you may be pushing that thick abdominal wall down towards the back of the abdomen and get closer to the organs in the back, such as the aorta and vena cava. In fact, a thin abdominal wall is one of the easiest ways to get in because you can simply get in through those layers very, very quickly without um, you know, much resistance. So a tight abdominal wall and extra intra-abdominal fat, that provides you the most safety against injuring a vascular structure. It may not provide you much safety against a um, uh, complication where the bowel is injured, but if you have a lot of fat inside the belly and very little fat on the outside, that's that's the safest entry for an obese patient. Okay. So it looks like, according to your note, you said the posterior fascia was unidentified, and we fired the visiport two times to attempt to divide the fascia. Okay. Um, at the time you fired the visiport, I'm assuming you believe that you had properly identified where you were in the patient's body? That's right. I, I felt like at that point we were looking at the, in the camera view, we were looking at the posterior fascia. Okay. Um, now, in your answers in interrogatories, you said in hindsight it was actually, the patient didn't have a, what was it, a posterior rectus sheath? Sheath. Okay. Or you can call it posterior fascia. Okay. And that's that kind of uh, wool-like woven appearance, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and that the aortoiliac, that that looks similar to a posterior rectus sheath, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, what does uh, the aortoiliac look like um, if you're looking at it through the visiport trocar? Um, yeah, again, very similar. They're both fibrous structures made of connective tissue. Um, when you're looking at the outside of the aorta, you're not seeing any blood because you're outside of the aorta. So all you're seeing is this white fibrous tissue, and through the camera view, it can look very similar to posterior fascia. Okay. Um, is there any difference in color? There might be a slight pink color if you can see if the, the light illuminates through the aorta and you get some reflection with you know, the blood reflecting back. Uh, it might look slightly pink, but it's, it's not... Uh, it's not a stark difference like you would see when you cut through the anterior fascia and you see the bright red of the muscle underneath. It's not quite that stark. So um, many times you get to the posterior fascia and it, and it looks pink like that because you've traumatized the tissue planes and there's some bleeding and it may look pink. So um, there's no real definitive way uh, of knowing if you're right on top of the aorta. Is there a light that's at the end of the laparoscope that's, that's kind of shining through the visiport as you're going through the different layers? Yes, as I described earlier, the, the camera comes through here. Around the circumference of the camera lens, there is a light, um, and that's, um, that's, being, that's light that's being generated off the field in, in a box, and using fiber optic cables, that light is uh, sent down through the scope. And so you can see that light um, through the, the clear plastic tip here. And this may vary by patient, and you can tell me if it does, but on average, um, how many times do you typically have to fire the blade to get through the posterior fascia? No, it, it does vary by patient. Um, uh, typically, uh, one or two fires is all that's required to get through. If you're firing more than two times or you feel like after two fires you haven't gotten through, you need to rethink where you are. And that's, that's exactly what happened here. I fired twice, and I didn't see the tissues come apart like I would expect. Um, I thought I was still firing on the posterior fascia and it wasn't cutting anything. Now, um, doesn't mean that you aren't still on the posterior fascia. Sometimes the knife blade fails or it dulls by the time you get down there and it doesn't really separate. Um, but at that point you want to, you know, rethink what you're doing. So, uh, for example, in this case I removed the whole assembly and I just inserted my finger to see if I could palpate and feel the entire abdominal wall and feel of, as if I had gotten all the way through. Now, at this point, how far down 
were you with the trocar? Um, if you on could, the shaft? Yeah. So the trocar is sort of this part, and mm -hmm. this is we call it the port. Sure. So we were we were probably maybe three quarters of the way up in this ribbed area. Um, and uh, this is the area that's used to fixate into the abdominal wall. So typically, on an obese patient, you know, when we're firing through, you know, you're going to get a good three quarters of the way, if not all the way down to the hub, you know, just to get through their abdominal wall if they have a thick one. So, you know, in her case, um, it, it was maybe thick enough to get to three quarters of the, uh, the port here. Okay. And after you fired the blade two times, did you see any sort of evidence of blood? No. Is that something that you would expect to see if you cut a vascular structure? You can, certainly, but it's not expected necessarily. Um, you know, again, um, if you're on it with the tip here and you activate the blade um, and you don't really see the tissues come apart, you're still sort of holding the blood in, if you will. You're, you're pressing on it enough that the blood doesn't spurt out. It's only after you remove this part that now all of a sudden there's nothing holding the, the, the wall of the artery together anymore and blood will start to flow up through the port. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so he said, unfortunately, we were not able to divide the fascia and I was unclear as to the exact positioning of the port. I removed the port camera and inserted my index finger to see if we had entered the peritoneal cavity. Um, the inserting of the index finger, um, is that something that you've done in the past? Yes. Okay. And what is it that you were expecting to feel or find by inserting your index finger? Well, it's sort of like inserting your finger into a box, maybe. Um, you know, once you're in, you should be able to curl your finger back up and feel the inside of the abdomen. You should be able to sweep your finger back and forth. In the, in the abdominal wall, everything is so tight that you're not going to be able to wiggle your finger around at all. It just will simply go through the, the hole that you've created. But once you're actually into the abdomen, you can feel a free space in there. And in fact, you can curl your finger up and hook the abdominal wall, and you should be able to feel that you're inside. And, and palpation is, of course, a, a common part of you know, medical practice. And so surgeons know how to palpate you know, the abdominal wall and know if they're through it and into the abdomen. Okay. And even with you putting the finger in, though, you still, you weren't able to determine whether or not you were actually in the peritoneal cavity, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, do, do you know why that was? Um, it could be from scar tissue. So maybe when I thought, maybe when I was in, I was palpating more bowel that was around it. Or it could be that, um, you know, the... Again, the, the hole that was created, the, the track that was created, let me remove that, the track that was created was right on top of, you know, the vascular structures, the aorta and the IVC. And so putting my finger in would have allowed me to palpate those structures, and so that would have felt like posterior fascia. I wouldn't have felt like, you know, it's a free space in there. Okay. So inserting my finger told me that there's little to no space underneath my track. Okay. Um... Let me see. It says, uh, it did not uh, appear as though we had fully entered the peritoneal cavity. The blade portion of the port was then removed, and the trocar without the blade was then inserted into the opening. Mm -hmm. To my surprise, we were able to enter the peritoneal cavity without difficulty. Why is it that you think uh, after you had reinserted that you were able to enter the peritoneal cavity without difficulty? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, by that point, um, you know, uh, when I put my finger in, um, you know, I probably dilated the track enough that this thing could go in nice and smoothly, and it went in smoothly, and, you know, we were, again, you, you feel this sort of loss of resistance when you're all the way in the abdomen, and when I put my finger in, I never really felt that loss of resistance. So when we put this in, we felt it. Why it happened the second time and not with my finger, to be honest with you, I don't really have a, a good answer as to why when I palpated with my finger, I didn't feel that sort of loss of resistance and I could move around. But as soon as we put this in, I could tell we were in, it was, it was freely mobile inside the abdomen. Okay. Um, and so we decided to insufflate the abdomen. The next step really is to confirm that we are in the abdomen by putting the camera through here to see if indeed we are seeing abdominal contents, organs inside the abdomen. But before we could get to that step, we connected the tubing, opened this up, and blood is flowing out of this. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming at that point you knew that there was some sort of vascular complication. Yes. Okay. Um, and where was the vascular complication? 
Um, it was at the junction of the aorta and the right iliac artery. Okay. And can you just, I, I realize this is not a 100% accurate picture, mm -hmm. but could you just put an X where that was? And again, I will oh. object because there's no way of knowing exactly where, but I will let you have the generic where. I understand, mm -hmm. and I think I had said on the record that it's not obviously 100% accurate. Yeah, so I, I, I can point, I can put an arrow, I guess. It's sort of right here. Um, <clears throat> at the junction of the aorta and that right-sided iliac artery. Okay. Now, were you were you turning the trocar? I mean, I know you said you had entered perpendicular, but we never changed angles. We kept going down perpendicular. So, sorry to interrupt. Okay. No, that's okay. Um, Maybe this, this drawing maybe isn't the best representation, but is it your understanding that her vasculature was further over towards where you had your insertion points? Yeah, in hindsight, I think it was further over, but the, the more important thing, I think, is the fact that even though when you're looking at an abdomen and you say, okay, incision here, that, that's just relative to the outside. What's going on relative to the inside is impossible to determine. So if you have this against, let's say, something, I don't know, like, like jello or, or maybe even a different texture, this thing moves around. Even though you're smack dab in the center of your incision, your incision in the whole complex can move around. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard for you to, to know exactly where in space that is. You know where you are relative to the incision. You know where you are relative to the depth of the abdominal wall. But where that abdominal wall is in relation to the underlying organs is sometimes hard to say. So if the organs are out of place or if the abdominal wall, like I said, is very floppy and you know can move around, you are literally cutting the skin on the left side of the abdomen, but your tip is literally on the right side of the patient's internal organs. It's, it's to the right of the patient's spine, even though your, your incision is on the left of the abdomen. And so uh, it's some combination of her, I believe, her uh, arteries were in an abnormal location, and the floppiness of her abdominal wall allowed us to have the tip of this right over top of the right side of the uh, aorta. Other than the location of where the, the injury occurred, it, do you have any other evidence that, um, or have you seen any other evidence that her arteries were in an abnormal location? Um. I, mean, I do have a recollection that there is um, either a study or some physical exam finding during the operation where it looked like her arteries were angulated, where they were in an odd shape, but I'd, I'd have to look through the medical record to exactly find it. But okay. it's, my, it's my general recollection after reviewing the record that the arteries were not exactly where they should be. Okay. Um, are arteries more or less, I know you had talked about other organs being floppy, but are arteries floppy or are they more or less fixed in position? No, arteries are fixed in their position, but arteries over time can um, change shape, if you will. So when you're born, they're straight arteries, like the aorta is a straight artery and the iliacs come out you know, at a particular angle and they're straight. But as time goes on with atherosclerosis and hypertension, you know, all of the things that um, we have in adult uh, life, you know, the diseases that we all have in adult life can cause the arteries to change um, shape. And so if there's a plaque, the artery may assume a curved position. Um, and we, we sometimes in the literature or in, in talking about this refer to it as tortuosity. It's, it's become tortuous. Um, or it's just simply that it's at an angle that's steeper than what we're used to seeing. And it may be that's a congenital problem too, but typically we see it more often just as um, a part of the aging process, the vessels over time. But in the moment of an operation, you wouldn't expect it to be flopping around. Okay. <clears throat> if the insertion point had been higher up on the left side and further to the left, would there have been less of a risk of vascular injury? Objection to form and foundation, you may answer in hindsight or prospectively. Well, 
I, I guess let's do prospectively first, then I'll ask you in hindsight. So again, it, it, it's always about trade-offs. Um, while you um, may, you will reduce the risk of a vascular complication if you were to have it further up and further to the left, but you're much more likely to have an injury to the underlying um, stomach, spleen, or small intestine in, in that higher position. Okay. And I'm assuming you would say the same thing retrospectively about this particular patient as well, correct? Um, yeah, retrospectively, you know, I would say that it, it would be a lower risk of vascular injury. Um, and uh, while I would never know if I would have ended up puncturing the bowel or the stomach, knowing what I know now that her abdomen is relatively free of adhesions, you know, that would have been a safe place to go in. Okay. And I understand this is obviously retrospectively, but would you, now knowing what you know about this patient, would you have chosen a different insertion point? Knowing that if you use this insertion point, there would have been this complication? Right. I, I, I'm gonna object, I, I don't think you, you're saying that if you knew he used a different insertion point, he wouldn't have a complication? No, no. What I'm, what I'm asking is, knowing what he now knows, obviously having been inside her abdomen and knowing what's obviously transpired because of where he was in, would he have chosen a different well, insertion? I mean, counsel, point? of course he wouldn't want to hurt. I mean, of course he wouldn't want this to happen to Miss Wiggins. That's not a fair question. No. I'm, I'm not going to have you answer that question. Okay. Uh, that's, that's a totally misleading question. Um, and it, it is, of course he wouldn't want to hurt his patient. And I'm not suggesting that he would. Um, my, my question is a little different. Um, assuming you knew what her anatomy was like, would you have chosen a different insertion point? I think it's the same question. Knowing that her anatomy and that, the, that, that there was a complication with the uh, iliac artery, artery or um, aortic artery. junction, um, of course you would use a different approach. I mean, how can you not, uh, I'm, I'm not following your question. Maybe you can re-articulate it, because that, that, that is just not a fair question. <coughs> um, I mean, Dr. Mead did not get up that day to figure out how he could Well, no, and I'm not, that, that's yeah, not what I'm saying. Okay. Because that's sort of how the question's coming across. Well, right? and um, that's not, that's really okay. not what I'm trying to okay. suggest. Um, <clears throat> If he had known she didn't have adhesion somehow preoperatively, if he had known preoperatively that, I mean, I mean, make the well, if you're gonna mean, make the hypothetical, and I'll let him answer answer hypotheticals. But if you're gonna make the hypothetical, please do it more definitively so we know what we're. If you had known preoperatively that she had this abnormal anatomy, the way that you ended up finding it, would you have chosen a different insertion point? Are you saying the, all right, so let's define what you mean by the different anatomy. The, the location of the vessels, the fact that there wasn't posterior fascia, what, I mean, what, I well, need I mean, you I think, to articulate exactly okay. what would be different, and then I will let him answer the question. But right, I and I think it. those were the two things that you had identified that you thought were abnormal. The, there is no <coughs> posterior fascia, and also that the vasculature was in an abnormal position, correct? Well, I said more than that. Um, I said that she had a floppy abdominal wall um, where, and, and so you sort of know that interoperatively, but knowing the significance of how floppy it was, uh, I mean, I guess the, the only way I can answer your question is, is only a fool would do the same thing knowing that there's going to be a complication. There, there's no way that you would do that. The factors that came to light retrospectively certainly would have made me think about doing something different, but prospectively as I was looking at the abdomen, looking at the factors, you know, that seemed to be a very safe, reasonable place to go into. And I stayed away from the area in the left upper quadrant close to the rib cage for very good reasons. You're going to be very close to the stomach and the uh, small intestine, the colon in that location. You're going to be way too close to your operative field, so you're not going to be able to see any of the anatomy and be able to perform your operation successfully. And in the worst of cases, if the liver is in that area, you're going to you know, fire your trocar right through the liver. 
So I went into the place where I felt I could gain access um, to do the operation that I was planning to do in a safe fashion. That's, that's sort of the only thing I can say. I would never okay. do anything knowing that it was going to lead to a complication. Um, okay, going back to your note here, we're, we're kind of winding down with this note. So um, after you identified that there was uh, an injury to the uh, right aortoiliac artery, uh, you then called in, I think, a vascular surgeon? Is that right? Um, let's see here. I think you may be a cardiothoracic surgeon. Oh, okay. Surgeon. It, Dr. Uh, Sang? Sang. Is that easy, a cardiothoracic surgeon? He calls himself cardiovascular surgeon. Okay. Um, so, yes, we, we opened the abdomen. Well, the first thing we did was we got as much control of the bleeding as we could by applying pressure to the area. Um, and then we were able to expose the area. Mm -hmm. Was this after she no. was opened? This is after she was opened, yeah. I so we, okay. right. yeah. So we so might we, have jumped one, one step right. ahead. So you open, um, got control, uh, and let anesthesia know that, you know, we had this complication and that they could expect blood loss and so that they could prepare their um, resuscitation efforts. And um, once we found that, it, it says here, once we identified, um, sorry, ultimately we were able to isolate a portion of the iliac artery which was injured and that's when we call for the vascular surgeon. Okay. And uh, it looks like uh, you were able to, you were there assisting the vascular surgeon, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and it looks like the vascular surgeon identified first that there was some sort of injury to the anterior side of the vessel? Yes. Okay. And that was repaired? Yes. Okay. Um, and then at that point, you didn't see any evidence, any further evidence of bleeding? That's correct. Okay. Um, at that point, did you palpate um, any of the arteries downstream to make sure that there was good flow before you proceeded on with removal of the lap band? Yes. Okay, and at that point there was good flow? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the way that the note reads, after you removed the lap band, um, you noticed after palpating those vessels again, first of all, why did you palpate the vessels again? I just wanted to make sure everything was done correctly. Okay. And at that point you had noticed that uh, it appeared like there wasn't good flow? That's correct. Okay. And then what did you do next? We asked Dr. Zang to come back in and reevaluate. Okay, and what did he do after he reevaluated the patient? Uh, he concurred with my finding that there was poor flow in the in the, the iliacs on both sides. Okay, and um, I guess then what was the next step after that? Um, could I refer to his note? Sure, uh, sure. I think he I think he removed the sutures that he initially placed and re-explored the area. Let me just check here. <clears throat> So first of all, what Dr. Zhang did was heparinize the patient. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a critical point because initially the patient did not receive heparin. Normally when you're going to occlude blood flow to prevent clotting of the other vessels downstream, um, you would um, place the patient on heparin and heparin is an anticoagulant to help the blood continuously flow so that clots don't form. So this time knowing that um, he was going to have to do more extensive exploration, he heparinized the patient and then says proximal control was obtained um, on the aorta above the iliac and then below the kidney hilum. Okay. You're not critical of Dr. Zhang for not heparinizing the patient the first time he made the repair, correct? Objection. I think that would be outside of his level of expertise. Which I, I, I think you're asking him an expert opinion beyond what he did and what he knows. Um, so you can answer if you have an opinion one way or the other, but if that's outside of your expertise, then you need to advise counsel. I mean, as a general surgeon, we're exposed to some vascular surgery, but um, I'm not a vascular surgeon, and the specialty of vascular surgery has um, specialized quite a bit since I was in training. Uh, what he did, the initial um, repair, looked very reasonable. The, he controlled the bleeding and we palpated the vessels and we didn't actually clamp the aorta. We just simply did the repair while blood was still flowing. So at that point I thought it was reasonable to not heparinize the patient. So I don't have any um, criticism of 
Dr. Zhang's repair technique, and I don't feel like I'm really qualified to make a, a criticism. Okay. Would, and you can tell me, once again, this might be outside of your expertise, but I have to ask a question because of some of the things that you just raised. Um, would not heparinizing the patient with the first repair have led in any way to having to do the second repair? Same objection, but you may answer. Objection to form foundation, cause for speculation. You may answer. I'm yeah. sorry. Of course you can answer. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's really outside my area of expertise. I don't know when, what indications you must heparinize a patient for and which one you don't. Um, you know, anytime a patient is hypotensive, they can develop clotting, so uh, it wouldn't just be one factor whether you heparinized or didn't heparinize. There certainly would be multiple factors that might lead to clotting. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I really couldn't say whether it led to him having to go back and do something a second time. Okay. And uh, how many, how much blood did uh, Miss Wiggins uh, lose? I think you had that. We estimated in. three liters. Okay. Um, how many liters of blood are in the human body on average? Five or six. Okay. Um, would you classify this as a significant amount of blood loss? Yes. Okay. Um, what was her condition like after you made the second repair? Um, well, I can tell you her condition changed two times. It changed obviously immediately after we opened and she lost a lot of blood very quickly. She was hypotensive and unstable at that time. But after we had completed the first repair, um, the blood loss had stopped and anesthesia was able to resuscitate the patient. So she had become more stable um, at the beginning of the second repair. Her condition didn't change again after we decided to do the second repair. So she remained stable throughout that repair. Okay. Um, and I know uh, you saw her at various points in time, you know, while she was still at Southern Maryland Hospital, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, was she intubated? Yes, she was. Okay. Do you remember how long she was intubated for? I don't recall at this time. Okay. Um, when you saw her, do you remember whether or not... Um, and just for the record, I... So it's not, I don't think she was intubated the entire time. It, it, the way the question and answer came across, was she intubated the entire time? She was not intubated the entire time. She yeah, was intubated. Because he did have discussions with her, and I just want to make sure you're aware yeah. of no, it. No, I'm, I'm aware of it. I, I just okay. want to know what his answer Just the way the question and answer came out, it sounded like, when he said, was she intubated at that time, I think so. But okay. I didn't want it to be... <clears throat> misread or misconstrued that she was intubated the whole time. Okay, well, I, that, that's why I asked you whether or not she, how long she was intubated, and you said you didn't know for sure. I don't know for sure, but okay. I know that it was more than 24 to 48 hours because okay. she, um, we would have expected her to be extubated by that point. Okay. It was um, 11 days? That sounds that? right. Okay. Now, during that period of time, you saw her on several occasions, and um, I'm assuming you've done examinations on patients before where you identified whether or not there was any sort of response to pain. Have you? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you remember uh, whether or not during that 11-day period you recall her having any sort of response to pain? Um, no. The times that I saw her, um, she was always on sedation, so she was basically in an induced coma. Um, so her responses to pain would be altered, and I um, never got the impression that she was in pain during that time. If another doctor had noted something like that in a note that the patient did have a response to pain during that period of time, would you have any reason to dispute that? Objection calls for speculation. I mean, without, without looking at the note, I, I can't say that I have reason to dispute it, but, you know. Take a short break. Yeah, why don't we do that because that might allow me to find where I am in this record. We are going off the record down 12.54 p.m. We are back on the record. The time is 12.59 p.m. 
All right, Doctor. Um, I don't know because my num my pages are numbered differently. I think, but um, <coughs> I don't know. There's a uh, a note that's on December the 18th, 2013, by a Doctor David Hadek. Hadek. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I could probably find it in this Southern Maryland records. It's in the ICU, I assume. Yeah. Is it in the mm -hmm. ICU? Mm-hmm. So okay. Southern Maryland Hospital. So that would be notes, though, right? Is it progress notes? It is a, a dictator it's progress. Note. A dict it's a consultation report. Okay. Consults nine. Well, there's really. I mean, you can look at it if you want to. I mean, it's really one thing. I want. Why don't if you, you, if you want to show me yours, okay. right? Yeah, and maybe maybe well, we'll look at it that way. So it says. Well, let me let him look at it so okay. you can look at it in context. really the underlying section there. So this is the December 18th, you can look through the whole night. Okay. Okay. And Really, this just kind of goes back to the questions I was asking previously. Here, it indicated that uh, the patient sedated, says she's not responsive, but says that she does respond to modestly deep pain. Um, you, you obviously saw where it said that? Yes, I saw that. Okay. Um, does that mean that the patient is experiencing pain? No. Um, that's, that's a statement of his um, physical exam. So um, when we talk about a patient's level of consciousness, we talk about whether they are responsive, which is the first thing you put, that she was not responsive. And then you d try to determine their level of response to pain, which is the next stimulus, if you will. Um, so you can have in ever-increasing painful stimuli applied to the patient, and at some point they should respond. And he's documenting that when it was deep stimulation, the patient responded with, with a grimace to show that she was having pain, which basically meant that she was in a deep sedation, which is what he kind of alluded to earlier in that note. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and looking through the records, uh, it, it appeared that she suffered from renal failure, um, liver failure, um, and at one point uh, in the ICU, she had contracted um, pneumonia and became septic. Um, are all of those complications things that were as a result of the vascular injury? Objection to form and foundation. You may answer. Um, so those are all a complication of her excessive blood loss that occurred from the vascular complication, yes. Um, she went into what I would describe as multi-organ failure from uh, massive blood loss. Uh, her ability to recover from that is individual to her. Um, every patient responds to massive blood loss differently. Um, in her case, she had all those complications. Okay. Was, uh, I know at some point she ended up uh, receiving um, cryoprecipitate, uh, fresh frozen plasma, and packed red blood cells. Was the need for that because of the blood loss as well? I can't really be sure about that. I think I'd have to leave that opinion to the hematologist because she also had pre existing um, blood disorder, ITP, um, and that may have uh, contributed because once you're in a state of distress, that pre-existing condition can um, kick in, um, and uh, that may uh, have led to her requiring, you know, more blood products than would be expected. What is ITP? It means immune thrombocyto thrombocytopenic purpura. It's essentially a condition where your immune system chews up your body's platelets. Okay. Um, was she suffering? any sort of active problems from that prior to her coming in on December the 10th, 2013? Not that I'm aware of, no. Can massive blood loss exacerbate ITP? I think so. Why was she ultimately transferred to Georgetown University Hospital? Um, so 
much of her condition had stabilized, but they still did not have a good understanding of her hematological uh, abnormalities. And so um, essentially the hematologist recommended that she be transferred there for a reevaluation by the Georgetown hematologist. Okay. Um, after she was transferred, did you have any further contact with her? No, I did not. Okay. And I'm assuming you at no point then provided any sort of care or treatment for her after that once you left on, was it December the 31st? Correct. I, I didn't see her again after that, nor did I provide any kind of care or follow-up. Okay. Give me one second here. One of the warnings on the um, Visiport insert, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I know what year this insert is from. It was provided to me by council. Do you know what year this insert so is it's from? It's a current one. It came from a current Visiport. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the warnings says that great care should be taken when approaching the level of the peritoneum. Would you agree with that statement? Objection. Let him look at what you're sure, reading. It's, uh, and then context. Warning right here. Excuse me. So, could you repeat your question for me? I just wanted to know whether you agreed with that statement where it said great care should be taken when you're approaching the level of peritoneum. Objection to form and foundation, but you may answer. I think you need to take great care throughout an operation, not just when you reach the peritoneal cavity. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that that's out of bounds. That's certainly part of the operation, but I, I take great care throughout the entire surgery. Do you have any idea why it is that the manufacturer of the Visiport Choker would be warning about that in their insert? Objection for foundation costs for speculation. I'm not Same a lawyer, you are. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a lawyer, you guys are. I'm sure there's reasons they have to put that in there. Um, but as a surgeon, you um, proceed with any operation, big or small, with great care. Okay. Um, another warning is failure to monitor the depth of the entry of the Visiport plus optical trocar may result in continued blunt or sharp dissection after the instrument has entered the body cavity, increasing the risk of injury to internal structures. Would you agree with that warning? Yeah. Again, those warnings all sound reasonable. Would you also agree with the warning that says do not apply excessive pressure to the Visiport optical trocar? Yeah, I believe I testified earlier that, you know, you have to avoid putting excess pressure because that can increase the risk of injury. Okay. And you don't believe that you applied excessive pressure in this case? No, I don't. And I think you, you may have said this earlier, but you would never fire a visiport optical trigger blade in the peritoneal cavity, correct? Objection. If you knew you were in the peritoneal there you cavity. Go. Objection to form and foundation. You may answer. Yes, if I felt I was already in the peritoneal cavity, you would no longer um, use the blade, so it's not advisable to use it. Have you. So you've been using the visi. Sorry, this is all messed up. You've been using the visiport optical trocar for several years, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, how many times have you caused an injury to the vasculature while using the Visiport optical trocar? Objection to form and foundation and uh, admissibility ultimately, um, but you may answer. I join in her objection. I only know of that one other time, which is the case that's pending. Okay. Do you remember, and I don't want to know anything else about the case, but all I want to know is what part of the vasculature was injured in that case. Uh, I don't think that that, I, you can look it up, you can look up the complaint if you want to and I'll be glad to give you, but I, I, I'm uncomfortable in a lot of different ways. One is HIPAA, um, even though there's a, well, but you can identify the person and you can 
then if he gives you information about her personal medical care, then he could be in violation of HIPAA um, because there's a case name attached to it. So I would prefer for everybody's safety that you just look it up. And I'll be glad to give you the, okay, the name of the case. Okay, if you would agree to give me a, a yeah, copy of the case. I'll give you the name of the legal case because that's open for public and you can take a look at the complaint and do whatever you okay. want to do with that. That's fine. I'm not trying to keep you from that information. I just don't want to get in a situation where there's a violation of the HIPAA rules. Okay. Um, I appreciate your... Sure. <coughs> Are you able to provide me the copy of the complaint today? No, because I am not... My secretary's not here. <laughs> but we can send it to you. We can okay. send you Okay, and if you could send it to me yeah. uh, by email. Or I can give you the name of the case, and then you can look it up and pull out the complaint. Okay. Well, okay. We'll do it that way. Um, it's just safer that way for all of us. You too. You don't want to be in violation of it. Um, give me one second here. Let me just uh, double check. Actually, can we have the uh, package insert copied and identified as exhibit number three? Um, um, I know the, the font no. is really small. The answer is no. I can't have a copy because it's too big. The whole thing is too big. But I will do this for you, and I'm not going to let you mark it because I want to have the original. This is mine. You should have brought your own if you wanted it marked. But what I will do is I will have when my secretary returns, have her work at copying the English version because it, right. I mean, that's... It, that's it's, the only part that I care about. Yeah, so I'll, I will have her copy the English person, or the, yeah, the English person. We'll have her copy the English portion of it, and then I will send it to you. And okay. I'll put that on the record, but I, I'm not going to let you mark it, and I have no ability, I can tell you right now, I have no ability to copy this. Um, and that, that's who would have to do it right now would be me. Right. Um, and I, I don't know how to do a document like this that's this small. But I can tell you I'm going to work on two things, copying it and making it bigger so we can read it. Okay, fair enough. How's that? Um, but I will give you, I'll give you a copy of what is here. Okay? All right. Sounds good. I think uh, those are all the questions I have. All right, Doctor, I just have one. Um, we were looking at this document that we were talking about with a really small print. Yes. What does it say about insufflation and use of this <coughs> device with or without insufflation? Um, well, under warnings and precautions, number one, <clears throat> Insufflation of the abdomen prior to the insertion of the Visiport optical trocar is at the discretion of the surgeon as determined by the conditions of, the, of each case. The potential for abdominal adhesions or anatomical abnormalities should be considered before using this device without first establishing pneumoperitoneum. Okay. Now, based on your training and experience with this device, um, and the information that's been provided to you over the years from other surgeons, from the representatives that sell this device, what is your understanding as to whether or not insufflation is a required prerequisite to the use of this device? And yeah, my understanding is that it is not a required prerequisite. In fact, the design of the device is such that it allows a surgeon to uh, safely enter the abdomen by visualizing the tissue layers and not actually insufflating the abdomen um, as would, would be uh, done but with a blind, blind pass from a, a varus needle. All right. In this case, if a blind pass had been done in the, with a varus needle, it would have been at the same location that you would have inserted the trocar? Yes. Is that correct? And what would have happened if we would had a blind pass of the varus needle and there was insufflation? and that needle went into the same location that the trocar did, which is the uh, junction of the iliac crest, what would have happened? Objection, calls for speculation. You may answer. I don't think I'm pretty confident that the patient would have died because we would have given her a massive air embolism. Okay. Been much worse for her. I have uh, one follow-up question. I actually have. Oh, oh okay. All right, I wasn't sure. <laughs> a couple questions, too. I'm not okay. sure I'm done. Can I fill Oh, yeah. yeah sorry. There was a moment of silence. I wasn't sure. I was, like, actually collecting my thoughts. <laughs> oh, but, okay. Hey, um, you know, I'm blonde, and sometimes it takes a little longer than other times. I want to make sure I look back at my notes. I may be done. Um, and why would there have been the, the potential of an air embolism? 
Well, again, explain the process. You're sticking a needle into the abdomen. If it goes in the same location that the trocar went, it goes right into the the same location in the iliac artery, and then you insert CO2. Correct. What what would have What are you doing then? Objection. Give me an answer. So I'm I'm going to go back to sort of how a varus needle is confirmed to be in the peritoneal cavity. First of all. It's inserted, again, blindly, and you're relying on a combination of pressure, feel, and a series of clicks that the device makes so that you know that you've entered the various layers. You expect to hear two clicks, one at the anterior uh, rectus sheath and one at the posterior rectus sheath. Uh, I'm quite certain, knowing her anatomy now, that we would have never heard that posterior click until we were into the aorta. And at that point, um, if we had insufflated it's definite that we would be putting CO2 into the vascular system. And are you putting CO2 into the body before you can see anything inside the body with, the, with any kind of camera? Yes, of course. Okay. So the, the needle then goes right where the trocar goes, but without the benefit of a camera to show you what layers you're going through, correct? That's correct. And what you're then relying on is the tactile or, or and somewhat the listening of these clicks of this of this uh, resistance as you're going through the various layers. Objection. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And as you're um, relying on the tactile and the listening, um, assuming she doesn't have one of the layers that you are trying to go through, then the same thing happens. Occur Objection. Correct? Yeah, I think so. I think the, the, the needle ends up going through the anterior fascia, the muscle, and the, the next time we would hear a click would be when it went through a hard structure like the aorta. Okay. And so the feel of the structure going into the aorta or the feel of going through that posterior fascia would be similar in terms of the tactile resistance? Objection. Yes, it would okay. be. And then when does the, how do you then put in the CO2 through the same needle? Correct. There's a port at the top. You put the same tubing that you would otherwise attach to uh, this port. It looks very similar. Uh, in fact, it's a universal connection. You connect it to the needle and then add insufflation to the abdomen. Okay. Your chair just broke. Did it? Uh, it's okay. We'll send you a charge for that. Just kidding. Um, There were some discussions that council had, um, well, actually I think you clarified that later. Okay, that's all the questions I have. So now I will turn you over to the others again. May I go next? Yeah, go ahead. I just have a couple questions, doctor. Yes. Um, when you first met Ms. Wiggins at Doctors Community Hospital, were you seeing her in your capacity as a member of Washington Surgical Specialists? Yes. Okay. And when you um, saw her the second time, that would have been at your office, um, which was the offices of Washington Surgical Specialists, correct? Yes. And when you operated on her at Metzger Southern Maryland Hospital, were you doing so also as a member of Washington Surgical Specialists? Yes. Okay. And that's all I had. I have nothing further, actually. We'll read and sign. Thank you much. This marks the end of the deposition. We're going off the record. So the time is 1.18 p.m.